All right, so this chapter opens up with us seeing the moments leading up to the first round of Gojo versus Sukuna, and it's a pretty incredible first round. But we're seeing Gojo and Ichiji in this building in Shibuya, and I'm pretty sure this is where Jogo versus Sukuna took place because we're seeing that big rock in the ground here, and I'm pretty sure that's the result of Jogo using his maximum technique on Sukuna. This could be further foreshadowing, maybe, you know, because Sukuna did win that fight. But anyway, Ichiji asked Gojo, like how it felt inside the prison realm because you know we the audience and i guess all the characters as well we're really sure of what time was going to be like in there and gojo says it's similar to how it feels when work gets really busy the contradictory feeling when a week passes by in the blink of an eye and you wouldn't ever want to do it again and this is like totally gege writing here the way that he describes it in a very like ambiguous but yet still straightforward way and yeah i mean i get it but at the same time i guess you're really not supposed to fully get it you know he's not giving you an example exact unit of measurement here. Then Gojo asks Ichiji what happened to all the people in B5. And since this was the epicenter of where Kenjaku released all of those cursed spirits from Ghetto's cursed spirit manipulation, he says that the non-sorcerers all over Tokyo were less likely to survive the closer they were to Shibuya, but all of the people in B5, which is where Gojo was originally trapped inside the prison realm when he was taking on the big natural disaster curses, since the remnants of Gojo's cursed energy was there, none of the cursed spirits came near there which is interesting, but totally makes sense. And then he asks if they had suffered from any side effects from Unlimited Void, because Gojo activated his domain expansion for 0.2 seconds in order to try to thwart the plan that the big natural curses were trying to implement against Gojo at that time. And since there were so many innocent civilians around there, they had to, of course, be a part of the domain as well. That's why he only did it for 0.2 seconds. And it turns out that they're pretty much fine. EG says that they have all been fully rehabilitated and returned to their normal lives. And Gojo's like, like, oh, that's great. And then they start walking up to the roof of the building and we see Uruhime and Gakuganji up there. This is going to be the beginning of one of the best sequences in the series, in my opinion. Maybe one of the best sequences in all of battle manga, or at least the modern ones of like the last 10 years. But we quickly cut over to Sukuna, who is observing Gojo from a distance, or at least he could see his cursed energy. Because there was never any timetable put in place. They only set the date of this fight, so it could have happened at any time. Which is like fine for both sides, because Sukuna is already aware that something is going down. But we'll find out later why he's none the wiser to the exact plan which is just brilliant but then we also have a flashback of gojo talking to gakuganji and gakuganji straight up tells gojo like yeah i was the one who killed yaga we know of course because it goes back to after the shibuya incident when the higher ups were pretty much instructed to classify gojo and masamichi as like public enemies number one and number two masamichi more so because of like the whole cursed corpse stuff but gojo's cool with it because mainly he's placing the blame on himself for being sealed up in the first place because if he wasn't then all of this would have been prevented and that's understandable of gojo he has been the pillar of jiu-jitsu society since i don't know high school maybe even longer than that but he's always had this burden and responsibility on him as being the strongest and trying to keep everything in balance but he also doesn't blame gakuganji because he says he's the ultimate example of a man just following orders, which he was. And he says that, you know, I can trust you to some extent because of that. So I really like this turn of events from Gojo and Gakuganji, to be honest. We talked about this in the previous chapter because we saw Gojo and Gakuganji with Udihime walking down the steps, like leading to where they are now. And we were like, man, there's got to be some explanation for this. And we assumed that maybe Gojo was just going to be cool with it because he was simply following orders. And Gakuganji isn't a terrible person. He's not like a full-blown heel by any means, more of a tweener character maybe left of face if that makes sense or left of center but Kakuganji also reveals that Yaga did tell him that there is a process to replicate what had happened with Panda you know making a perfect cursed corpse essentially but he didn't tell the higher-ups and he kind of kept it to himself and Gojo respects it he's like you know you've changed haven't you Gramps and that the secret behind Panda would be ranked as special grade information. And that's super interesting because I think that could also be a little foreshadowing maybe to Panda's ultimate glow up, which he is definitely going to have. Like, I don't think Panda's just going to stay in his small child form for the rest of the series. That would be a discredit to his character, especially since he was absolutely destroyed, like embarrassingly, by Kashimo. Even after having a whole chapter dedicated to this fantasy pseudo flashback that he had so this could mean that i don't know maybe panda's glow up will have him be special grade in power possibly 
I mean, of course, it literally means that the information is special grade in itself. But like I said, it could be also tying to Panda as well. But then Gojo says that referring to Gakuganji, maybe if you were at the head of HQ, things would be a bit better. And we see the higher ups and they're all dead. And when we first saw the spoilers for this, we thought, wait, does this mean that Gojo killed all of them? Because he did say that, you know, maybe he should just kill all the higher ups before. But I think that was just an idle threat by Gojo. I don't think he killed all of them here. I mean, it is a possibility, but I more so think this is Kenjaku because it goes back to chapter 191 when Kenjaku was talking to Noritoshi and Noritoshi was like, have you already removed the party responsible for recommended Suguru Geto's execution? And then Kenjaku was like, as well as the one who named Akotsu and Yuji's executioner. So that, I guess, is tying up here, and it's like, yeah, Kenjaku killed all of them. I don't think this is Gojo, because Gojo would kind of be tarnished in the eyes of most of the fans at this point. I mean, not me, and I'm sure a, a lot of the people watching this, but, you know, we have to keep Gojo a strict babyface at this point. Like, he can't just murder people like this, especially in cold blood. It'd be a different story if they attacked him first, which they never would, because they're not that stupid. But also him saying it would be better if Gakuganji was in charge, and I think this is more so what's going into the end game like after everything wraps up there still has to be kind of like a jujitsu higher up kind of order and i think this means that gakuganji will take over and he'll be somewhat of a just leader in this like not biased and corrupted the way that they were before so then we get to the big awesome sequence that i was talking about and gojo and ichiji are heading to the roof and gojo tells ichiji that he trusts him the most because Ichiji doesn't hold himself in high regard. He just knows that he's like an auxiliary manager and that all he can really do is like the curtains and the barriers. And it's like, yeah, but I trust you the most. And, and that's totally understandable because we, the audience, trust Ichiji too. That He's never given us a reason to not trust him. So Ichiji just goes full like effort here because he knows that Gojo has put trust into him. And Gojo is the strongest. And this is like the peak of the series. Like this is where everything matters the most. So he has to make this count. Then we see Uruhime getting prepared as well and it's finally revealed what her curse technique is and it's called the solo solo prohibition zone so it's essentially allows her to buff a sorcerer's cursed energy or it says their reserve and output temporarily enhanced as long as they remain in range and this is an incredible curse technique. I'm not sure why Gege waited so long to reveal this because this really would have helped out in the story at multiple points before this, but I guess better late than never. Then it's also said that the mastery of jujitsu can be said to be mastery of subtraction. The skill of a sorcerer can be judged based on their ability to emit prerequisites like hand signs or incantations in order to fully activate their technique. And we've seen this mostly from Sukuna, to be honest, because you know Sukuna is the goat of jujitsu as they also point out in this uh, chapter later on the strongest sorcerer in history versus the strongest sorcerer today but it doesn't mean that you have to do that it's more so just you know showing your mastery but it's more so laid out here that all of the sorcerers that we see setting up this you know each gojo hime and gakuganji are all doing the hand signs and the prerequisites they're not missing out on anything because they want this attack to be as absolutely unbelievably powerful as possible now as for what gakuganji is doing here i have no idea i'm not even sure if his curse technique has been fully explained yet i mean we've seen him use it maybe twice in the series not so much against masamichi but back in in the Tokyo Goodwill arc, we saw him use it. And I guess he can like amplify melodies through his guitar with his cursed energy or something but i guess maybe this could be used in a supportive manner as well i mean he doesn't have an electric guitar like he did before he kind of just has like a analog shamisen here but it says that by using the ritual to channel Udhime's curse technique she was able to achieve 120 percent of its normal effect so yeah doing the chants and all that stuff does make a difference i mean we even see gojo doing it I'm pretty sure he hasn't done this before. Like, that's how serious he is. Like, he says nine points, polarized light, crow, and shmoyo chant. The gap between within and without. And we've seen characters say stuff like this before, and it doesn't really mean anything, to be honest. It's kind of just, like, cool wordplay or, like, decoration words, uh, to be honest. But in the world of jiu-jitsu, of course, it does amplify things because it allows Gojo, along with the help of everyone else, to have a hollow technique purple with two hundred percent output this is by far the strongest thing we've ever seen in the series and gojo was able to fire this off against sukuna in like a moment sukuna wasn't able to see this coming because of ichiji's barrier because he misread it because it was being contained 
I mean, he was aware of Gojo's presence, as we pointed out earlier, he can see it emanating from like over a mile away, but he wasn't able to sense the immense amount of cursed energy that was the output of that attack until it was like right in front of him. So it was essentially being shot with like a sniper bullet, but this sniper bullet is a 200% output hollow technique purple. And all that Sukuna can really do is just put up his hands immediately to try and stop the attack. And yeah, this thing is destroying buildings and whatnot. Too. And also, I thought that this would have just nuked the entire city, but I guess it's more so condensed and compressed so that it's just hitting Sukuna and not destroying anything else, because I'm sure if Gojo really wanted to, he could. And surprisingly, Sukuna just takes this on the chin somehow. I mean, he is Sukuna after all. And he is at 19 fingers or maybe 19 and a half uh, fingers worth of strength because while he doesn't have the last finger it was said that gojo likely has it for a contingency or just to stop yuji from being executed but he did eat like that mummified corpse of himself at least ahead of it so i guess that amplified him to like 0.5 or whatever or point whatever you can make up whatever kind of variable you want but it only takes off sukuna's right hand and i'm not sure if he can even reverse curse technique back from this because it was like hollow purple that destroyed it i mean it probably but also that would mean that kojo like permanently maimed a megumi as well because you know this isn't sukuna's main body but still the fact that this was the strongest attack that they could possibly produce at this point i mean amongst the four of them. I'm sure if the rest of the Jiu-Jitsu uh, high joined in, they could produce an attack stronger. But you know, with the group that they had here, they, they essentially created like a Jiu-Jitsu new and all it could do was just take off Sakuna's right hand. But I'm sure they knew that it wouldn't completely take him out. But you know, maybe they just thought best chance scenario it would. And the chapter ends with Sakuna like being confronted by Gojo, or at least it appears that he is. Like they're somewhat in front of each other here. And Gojo's like, it seems like you've got the wrong guy idea so let me just set things straight you're the challenger here which is like you know we're getting the old gojo back the last you know two chapters he was very serious and um, uncharacteristic of gojo like he seemed worried going into this fight you know rightfully so but now he's got his confidence back or at least somewhat of it and i'm sure a lot of the people were like wondering like who's the favorite here or who's the challenger and gojo's making clear that like sakuna is challenging him but to be honest it is gojo challenging sakuna <laughs> But that's where the chapter ends, and I really hope that we do get to see the continuation of this fight in the next chapter, but if we don't, and it just focuses more on flashbacks and stuff that had happened in the previous chapter that left off on cliffhangers or just cutaways, that would be fine too, because that is much needed. We have all the time to have Gojo versus Sukuna play out, and I do think Gege will deliver on this, because remember, all of the Cullen game fights that we saw before this lasted multiple chapters, even the more so inconsequential ones. So if this is cut short, it would really be devastating to the series and the momentum that it currently has which is riding at an all-time high at least by manga standards now also what we talked about before with jogo's maximum technique you know that he used against sakuna back at the shibuya arc this could also not just be foreshadowing that gojo is maybe going to lose but maybe that we're going to see gojo's maximum technique and you're thinking like wait isn't hollow technique purple his maximum technique and it could be but i don't think it is because he never says maximum technique. He says maximum cursed energy output when he's doing it before, but never like maximum technique. And that is always pointed out before a sorcerer does it. So I think this would be one last cool way for Gege to show the peak of Gojo's power, which you definitely haven't seen yet. And it would be whatever limitless maximum technique is. We also still have to see the maximum technique of what the 10 shadows is. And then that could go back to what we've talked about many times with the foreshadowing that Gojo, you know, in the past talked to Megumi about. It was like 400 years ago when the leaders of the Gojo clan and the Zenin clan had fought against each other and they killed each other and they both had the same set of power hours that they have now so maybe it comes down to maximum technique versus maximum technique but all right so we got an absolutely fantastic chapter here coming off of the previous we saw gojo launching a 200 percent hollow purple at sakuna with the help of being buffed by udahime gakuganji and ichiji and this oh 
only really took off Sukuna's right hand, even though he was caught off guard by that. And that brings us to the beginning of this chapter where he says, do you've let catching me off guard go to your head? And that's because they were able to mask the attack being built up with Ichiji's barrier. But it seems like Sukuna has immediately recovered from that, where off panel, he's just using reverse curse technique to grow back his arm. So yeah, that's showing you how powerful Sukuna is here. A 200% hollow purple was only really like a minor inconvenience to him. Then he says, Satoru Gojo, you're just a fish on a cutting board. You may flop around a lot, but you're still a nameless fish. And it's interesting the way that his hands are when he's saying this, because they resist resemble the hands that we saw when his two curse techniques were being explained dismantle and cleave in the right hand he's holding in the right hand he's holding the dismantle knife but in the left hand he's using the cleave knife and that was also in reference to like sushi the way that this is too which is interesting and this could play more into what the truth about Sakuda's abilities are here or it's just the way that he likes describing his abilities as if he's making sushi or something but i'll come back to that later so then they both start charging up and face off against each other like we see the cursed energy like emanating from their hands and gojo says you wanted me to hold back right too bad for you i've undergone special training i could totally wail on megumi since they look alike referring to toji so before we go further speaking of toji it seems that gojo is like dressed exactly like him and obviously it's not a coincidence and this could be gojo paying homage to toji since toji is i guess directly responsible for gojo rising to the occasion and becoming as strong as he is right now but it also could be giving us insight into what gojo is talking about here with too bad for you i've undergone special training now when i first read the spoilers of this i didn't really know what to make of it but now that we have the official translation here i think i know what this means because also after this he says dying once as yuji was a mistake of course referencing what happened in season one after they had run into the first finger bearer or at least i assume that's what he's talking about and he says i'll worry about megumi after i kill you hey guys also if you enjoy my jujitsu kaisen reviews and spoilers please subscribe if you haven't already it's fine if you don't want to but if you just needed a reminder here you go thanks and going back to the spoilers earlier this week i thought that gojo was holding back because he was using megumi as a vessel and megumi is like gojo's nephew essentially not literally but you know what i mean but it seems like he might not hold back and he is willing to kill sakuna you know and also kill megumi by proxy and that's because i think that gojo has figured out how to use reverse curse technique on others and like i said that could be tying back to why he's paying homage to toji here because one of the big revelations in his fight against toji was him figuring out reverse curse technique on the brink of death after being stabbed in the neck by doji so this could be the next level of that and that now gojo has figured out how to use reverse curse technique on others because before this i think only two or three characters in the series are able to perform that i mean just being able to use reverse curse technique as a sorcerer is already extremely difficult and rare but using it on others is taking it to the next level i mean obviously shoko can perform this akotsu can perform this as well but now it seems like gojo has joined that club and it totally makes sense why he went out of his way to have this training or at least the time that they had preparing for this battle he was more so concerned about how to save megumi now of course this isn't being confirmed in the chapter i'm just speculating as to what he's saying here but i think that's what's going on here he figured out that the only way that he can really take down sakuna is that he has to kill him and holding back is going to be an extreme detriment because he's the strongest sorcerer in history so if there's anyone you don't want to hold back against it's him so he figures okay i'm just gonna have to kill him so how do i save megumi in the process oh i'll just use reverse curse technique on him so kill sakuna then bring megumi back with reverse curse technique now again i could be wrong about that but i think that's what this is coming to and that's really cool i think that also raises the stakes in the best way because i was worried about gojo having to hold back against sakuna here you know him never fully 
going all out, but now that doesn't seem the case, and he is, because he knows that he can save Megumi regardless. So the battle begins, or should I say round two begins, and they have like a quick exchange of strikes until Sukuna throws like this right hook at him, similar to how Yuji throws it. I don't know if that was intentional by Gege or if that's just how he likes to draw right hooks, but Gojo like just drops to his back and then starts using Limitless in a really crazy way. So instead of like having the Limitless be a barrier around Gojo, he's now diverting it at Sukuna and like throwing him against the wall. Like Gojo's using Limitless in this chapter as if it's like telekinesis essentially. And again, it's not confirmed. Gege is showing and not telling here, which I really like when mangakas do that, at least when it's clear and it's not so ambiguous or we just don't understand what's going on. But I'm pretty sure that's what's going on here. But he winds up launching him through a wall and tracking him down on this bridge and Gojo just stomps this bridge apart. Like that's how powerful he is, like physically powerful through his cursed energy amplification. Then he lifts the bridge up, once again, using Limitless like it's telekinesis. Because I assume that he's just manipulating this imaginary force around him. Like, you can almost think of Limitless as gravity, although it's not. But the way that it's described, it's like a imaginary force somewhat. So he can have it, like, wrapped around him to defend himself, you know, as we've seen plenty of time in the series. Or he can use it to manipulate other things. And we see him doing that here with this bridge. And while Sukuna's still on and he throws it at a building. And Sukuna is able to avoid this and he starts running on another rooftop and then he activates Dismantle. And going back to what we were talking about earlier with the whole sushi stuff, where we saw him holding the Dismantle and Cleave Knives. And like I said, he was using Dismantle in his right hand. Now, I don't know if this means that he can only use Dismantle with his right hand and only use Cleave with his left, but that would be interesting if he is restricted in that way. It could be, I don't know, some kind of binding vow that he placed on himself in order to use multiple abilities. It also could have something to do with the markings on his body, which I still think probably play into his abilities and they will probably be explained. I mean, it's also a great way for Gege to just indicate that Sukuna has taken over a person, but there might be more to it than that. But Gojo seemingly avoids this at the last second. Now, I don't know if he's using Limitless to bounce it off of him or he's just dodging it and it goes cleanly through a building right behind him. Then Sukuna capitalizes on Gojo while he's distracted by looking at the building falling and we see that Sukuna makes contact with Gojo's Limitless here but then Gojo just deactivates it and grabs Sukuna's hand allowing the building to fall on the both of them and they go through one of the windows going through like this elevator shaft or hallway or something. Like this is something out of the movie Inception. This is gonna be a really great scene in the anime. But as they're tumbling through this building, Gojo kind of does his own jock and go. Like I guess this is Gege paying homage to Hunter Hunter, but in the best way, not in like the psychotic exposition way. But the building winds up falling and just destroying everything in the vicinity. And we see Sukuna and Gojo emerging from the rubble here, completely unharmed of course because you know they are the two strongest so it's going to take more than a freaking building falling on them to do much and gojo's like i'm blaming you for all the damage and sukuna's like like anyone will believe that and then gojo remembers that may is broadcasting this fight so yeah going back to two chapters ago i think may may said that she was going to live stream this fight on like the jujitsu dark web or whatever or the jujitsu tour browser so that she could have betting odds on it so yeah there's like i don't know how many people watching this thousands I don't know if millions but at least thousands of people are watching this fight and betting on it mostly people in the jiu-jitsu world I guess but now there's going to be a bunch of uh civilians aware of this as well I guess because you know the whole thing after Shibuya with uh, Japan's cursed energy monopoly being revealed but Gojo mentioning this at the end is definitely going to come back into play later for sure like it's super important that everyone is viewing this because something substantial is going to happen as a result all right so this chapter starts off with Gojo versus Sukuna continuing but we're seeing it from the perspective of all of Jiu-Jitsu High and everyone affiliated with them 
watching it on multiple monitors. This looks like something from like 90 Cyberpunk. And they're basically explaining what's going on in case we were confused in the previous chapter, because I know that I was. I definitely missed something crucial. And it's explained at the beginning here. And it's that Sakuna is using domain amplification, where he's essentially like coding himself in simple domain or wicker baskets, something like that. And they explain it as where it neutralizes by using a domain that doesn't grant a curse technique in order to pour an opponent's curse technique into the empty space. So yeah, that's very gege of an explanation there, but it essentially just means that they're coding themselves in a simple domain more or less so that they can bypass someone's curse technique. And this is super useful against Gojo because as we know, he is using Limitless where he just manipulates space and you can't hit him or land any punches and he also can like use telekinesis somehow with it or I guess he just manipulates the other space around you or just anything so that's how Sukuna was actually breaking through Limitless in the previous chapter and that's what I was talking about I didn't really catch on to that and I should have sorry about that guys but Gojo didn't deactivate it to grab Sukuna's hand in the previous chapter to like pull him into that building Sukuna was simply just breaking through it using simple domain and just his immense curse energy we actually find Find out how immense Sukuna's cursed energy is in this chapter and I'll get into that later but also domain amplification isn't like an easy thing like only elite people can really use this because even Kusakabe admits that he can't do it and the only other beings that we saw use this before were the disaster curses which were special grade and extremely powerful however we see Higuruma here he's just thinking to himself after that statement's made and he's like but I do have a sense of how it works and this might mean that Higuruma could possibly be using domain amplification later on in the series or whenever he comes back or whenever he fights somebody I mean he definitely is going to have a big moment because his domain expansion deadly sentencing is so amazing and it has so much potential to it that somebody has to be put on trial like one of these thousand year old sorcerers has to go through that and I'd love to see the end result of it but also Higuruma is like a genius he figured out jujitsu in like I don't know less than a month or something he also had his brain transfigured by Kenjaku to have that curse technique so there is some kind of significance to him for sure but then angel also explains that the drawback to domain amplification is that you can't use your innate domain now it says innate domain in the viz but she's just mainly talking about like your curse technique like you can't just use your curse technique while using domain amplification which is like you know the drawback to it but for sukuna that doesn't really matter because his cursed energy is so immense that he could just beat you down physically while using domain amplification as they say you know like supposing there's a way for sukuna to defeat the limitless curse technique aside from amplification gojo will lose so yeah he essentially does need a technique but he can also get the job done without it by you know just brute force beating him down but we might not get to that point but then going further they go on to talk about domains overlapping each other and what a battle between domains of Sukuna and Gojo would be like and we got some kind of like uh, unreliable narrators going on here because it does happen at the end of the chapter as we all know and we're going to be talking about that but it also goes into what happens with the guaranteed hits and Yuji says can a domain's guaranteed hit even pierce Gojo's curse technique he hinted it would that time a cursed spirit's domain swallowed us so he's talking about way back in the first season like one of the first episodes when Gojo is fighting Joe Go. and Gojo did say that like when he deflects one of Jogo's guaranteed hits within like I don't know it was like a fiery meteor thing he just deflects it with like his hand using cursed energy like he wasn't using limitless or anything so that's just how powerful Gojo is he could just exist in a special grades domain and just swat away the guaranteed hit with just his cursed energy so then going further into the domains clashing discussion here Choso says that perhaps there won't be a domain battle because Sukuna was the first person who showed us that you can open a domain expansion without closing it like in the sphere that we typically see but the way that everybody reacts to it it's like this is almost impossible actually Hikari himself says that it's basically impossible even Kashimo who is older than everyone here aside from Angel agrees with that sentiment but no it, it's not impossible it's kind of just like he and era stuff because we've seen it come from he and era people such as Sakuna and the only other person
person to open up a domain without closing it was Kenjaku. So this is like old world stuff, super elite, top of the food chain stuff that no one else can really do current day, I suppose, aside from like Megumi, but he has no choice but to do it. But he also needs to have like an area to fill it with, as we saw with him going against the finger bearer and him going against Reggie. Like he filled up that gymnasium as a means to hold his domain aside from, you know, just not closing it, which he obviously doesn't have the ability to do. But it's explained here by throwing water at someone without a water bottle because the water bottle would represent the domain closing as, you know, we see with Gojo. Like he's using a, a water bottle more or less to contain his water as to where Sukuna doesn't need that at all. He could just throw the water at you. And then we also get the painting on air without a canvas analogy, which we also got back before when Sukuna used it in Shibuya against Jogo. So it's not, you know, a perfect way to explain it since it is a, a little, I don't know, ambiguous and difficult to fully comprehend something like that. But I guess the painting on air makes more sense even though you can't do it. But even going further into that, Maki, it's like running software without hardware. So yeah, think about <laughs> running iOS without an iPhone. Like, you know, you, you can't. So then going further, they start talking about the curse energy consumption that this battle would take. And that, you know, throwing up domains and using them is extremely taxizing on a sorcerer for sure. And as we know before, you know, if you use a domain, then using your curse technique right after is extremely difficult because of, you know, how much cursed energy you had to use and I don't know if I could say this on YouTube, but it's kind of like a refractory period. But And this kind of even applies to Gojo because Inumaki says that Gojo would never run out of cursed energy. And that's not necessarily the case because he's just really good at efficiently using his cursed energy. Where it said that like he controls consumption through a constant self-preservation. So he's using just enough, but then he's instantly replenishing it. So that's the way that he essentially has infinite cursed energy. But he's just so efficient with it by the time that he uses some it will already be replenished however if he were to just do a domain expansion and then do a domain expansion again then that's way outside of the range of what his typical efficiency would be like he'd be using way too much then his cursed energy wouldn't have been replenished in enough time so yeah gojo can't just spam domains over and over again like the way that you would think i mean i don't know how many he can use but i don't know maybe two or three but then he's probably done after that like he's completely drained and then just expanding upon that, they start talking about Sukuna, where Kashimo's like, he's like a god. He activates curse technique and switches between amplification and innate technique quickly. If Gojo didn't have six eyes, Sukuna would even best him in cursed energy efficiency. And then Akotsu says he also has more overall cursed energy than I do. His hunch is twice or more. So it's not like they wouldn't open their domains due to a lack of cursed energy. And that's insane. So like I said in the beginning, that's kind of letting us know how much cursed energy energy Sukuna has, which we didn't really know before. I mean, we knew that he had a lot, but it was more so hyped up that like Okotsu had the most besides Gojo. And then, I don't know, Sukuna's amount was ambiguous, but now Okotsu hard scaling Sukuna to at least twice as much as Okotsu, who was, you know, the big cursed energy powerhouse before this point. So I also think it's interesting that he's saying twice or more. This could be giving us more insight into like Sukuna being comprised of two people or something like that. Two just geniuses like a Kotsu, but he like absorbed his brother or absorbed another person or something like that and that's why his four arms and two faces but yeah Sukuna pretty much unrivaled in curse energy and Gojo is only able to do what he's doing because of the six eyes which Sukuna doesn't have he's kind of just like uh, an evil MC I, I guess that's kind of what um, Sukuna more or less is at least in my opinion like we see the big three in typical series but I think with Sukuna Kenjaku and Arorame they're kind of like the anti big three Sukuna of being like the main character or the anti-main character but then we come into the final sequence of this chapter and it goes back to the unreliable narration where they actually are clashing their domains they're not even thinking about all the variables and everything that everyone's talking about in this chapter you know similar to hunter hunter dialogue but gege does it right they straight up go in both into their domain expansions and you know as we know sukuna's doesn't close and make the spherical thing the way that gojo's does so gojo's is just surrounding the malevolent shrine itself that's why we see it all warped the way that it is because yes both of their domains are overlapping but sakuna is only at the core of it 
his radius is like 140 kilometers or close to 200 kilometers, depending on what the translation you read is, but his radius is going way outside of what Gojo's is. And also we're seeing Malevolent Shrine again, and we're seeing like the three mouths on the side of it. I also think this is giving us more insight into what Sukuna's innate ability is. Yorozu said that it is called Shrine, although Viz called it Malevolent Shrine, but I'm pretty sure that's just what the domain expansion is. Shrine is like his innate ability, or I think that's what most of the hardcore community has agreed on. But now that their domains have overlapped, it's saying that their can't miss attacks are just canceling each other out because they're more or less even matched at this point. So it's just basically both of them inside of their domains just standing there. And I guess they could fight, but no can't miss attacks or instant hits are going to happen until one of them like go down. Because it says, you know, they fought with both their domains open. If one takes heavy damage or one of their domains collapses, is the other's guaranteed hit will immediately strike and yeah we see that happen because Sukuna's uh, barrier has a radius of 140 kilometers or close to 200 so it is surrounding Gojo's barrier at all times so think of Gojo's domain expansion as like a black sphere sitting on a 2d flat even bigger sphere so its radius will always be around it therefore it is vulnerable to being attacked by Sukuna's domain and as we saw before the outside of barriers are very vulnerable to attacks. We saw that Toji was able to break into Dagon's domain expansion, and most recently we actually saw that when Akotsu was fighting against Takako and Ryu, all three of their domains overlapped, and then the Cockroach Curse Spirit, Kuro Rushi, came in from the outside and easily broke it. So Sukuna is managing to do this just with his open domain attacks, like his slashing attacks, Cleave and Dismantle. So him using Cleave and Dismantle, or whatever the slashing abilities that he decides to use within Malevolent shrine are cracking the outside of Sukuna's domain expansion and breaking it. So then, as the narration also said, you know, once the domains are no longer overlapping or, you know, somebody takes damage or whatever, the domain that is still standing, their instant attack will instantly activate and that's what happened. And it looks like he's straight up decapitating Gojo. Like, when I first saw these panels, it looked like maybe he was just slicing his neck or something, but no, it is straight up going through it. Like, we see blood coming out of it on both sides. So Gojo is technically getting decapitated here. And this is like way more efficient than what Toji was doing because Toji kind of stabbed him in the neck, then also stabbed him in the head with like a little butter knife. But no, Sakuda just instantly cutting his head off. And it's like, is this the death of Gojo? Is he dead after just, I don't know, two and a half chapters of fighting? And I don't think so. I mean, come on. It, it would be so anticlimactic if Gege decides to end the fight here with just Sakuna instantly cutting off his head after outsmarting him with the whole domain thing. And part of me thinks that Gojo probably knows what's going on here with Sukuna's flat domain because his brain works much faster, you know, of course with the six eyes and everything, but also just his experience. So I'm thinking that this isn't the end for Gojo and he is just going to instantly reverse curse technique back from this. Well, at least hopefully. Like I said, it kind of would be anticlimactic, right? If he were just die here. So maybe this could also go back to what he was talking about two chapters ago, about how he underwent some special training so he didn't have to hold back against Megumi. I really do think that means that he can apply reverse curse technique to others, the way that we saw Kotsu and Shoko doing it. So he'd be able to heal Megumi after killing him and getting Sukuna exercised from him or whatever. But I also think that means that overall his reverse curse technique has been amplified. So he can just instantly heal himself and, you know, come back from having his head severed. And uh, the fight will continue because also Sukuna hasn't even begun to use the Ten Shadows yet. And that also goes back to what we've talked about many times on the channel. And it's that Gojo told Megumi that, you know, 400 years ago, the leaders of the Gojo clan and the Zenin clan fought in front of the hierarchy. And the leader of the Gojo clan had Limitless in the Six Eyes. And the, you know, the Zenin guy had the Ten Shadows technique. And they both wound up killing each other. So that kind of has to come to fruition. Like we have to see Sukuna use the full potential of the Ten Shadows against Gojo. So. So, yeah, I do think this is going to continue for at least another couple chapters. So, coming off of the previous chapter, we saw Gojo and Sukuna simultaneously activating their domain expansions. However, Sukuna's domain is open and doesn't close the way that Gojo's does. It also has a much larger radius. And because of this, Gojo's domain is essentially just a sitting duck within Sukuna's. And it's 
also very vulnerable to attacks from the outside. And this is exactly what Sukuna does as he attacks it with his slashing attacks, breaking it, leaving Gojo himself vulnerable to Sukuna's slashing attacks where we saw at the end of the chapter, he cuts cleanly through Gojo's neck. However, coming into this one, it turns out that Gojo was able to use his reverse curse technique instantly to heal, you know, avoiding his head coming off completely as we expected for the most part. But Gojo's problems aren't over here because now that he has just used his domain unsuccessfully, he is now unable to use his limitless curse technique for a little bit. And as we've come to know from Gojo, most of his fighting style revolves around using limitless. So at this point, he's basically just a normal sorcerer. I mean, a really strong one and ultra talented but without limitless he is very limited now at this point gojo has to essentially escape from sukuna's barrier or he's going to get lit up from his slashing attacks the same way that maharaga did back in the shibuya arc. and as we also learned at that time you can escape sukuna's barrier by simply just running outside of the radius of it since it's not closed this is actually one of the binding valves that sukuna put on it in order to make it so big and powerful and normally Gojo would be able to do this. However, since he is unable to use Limitless, he can't move fast enough. And Kusakabe explains this by saying that his instantaneous movement uses Limitless Curse technique to compress space and coordinates. And that's a great simplified way of putting it. It can also further explain how Gojo was manipulating his environment in the previous rounds, which we said was extremely similar to Telekinesis, but Gojo was just compressing space and coordinates of other objects objects, which, you know, mimics telekinesis more or less. And yeah, he's definitely not fast enough. And Sukuna instantly hacks away at Gojo with his slashing techniques inside of the domain. And it is vicious. One of the most violent sequences in the series by far. And as we talked about before, when Sukuna used this on Maharaga, he had obliterated him. You know, one of the strongest, if not the strongest Shikigami ever, at least that we know of. Gojo, however, is taking this. I mean, yeah, he's getting lit up and slashed through nearly every inch of his body, but he's such a beast that he's able to use reverse curse technique simultaneously surviving this just to show that, yeah, even without Limitless, Gojo is still a super beast. And at this point, he tries to escape by running away, but Sukuna instantly capitalizes on him and they go into a hand-to-hand -hand exchange, which ultimately ends in a stalemate. Then we go into some more commentary where it turns out that the center of the domain is not Sukuna himself, but it's the Malevolent Shrine. And going more into this, it seems like this is more so for the audience, if anything, where they explain that if you break the shrine in theory it wouldn't really do anything because it's merely just like an aesthetic symbol if anything i mean maybe this is going to come back into play later especially since it's damaged at the end of the chapter but this could just be gege clarifying it in case we were curious about it but also just using the shrine as a waypoint you can just see how far you need to go to escape the barrier i assume which is like a near 200 kilometer radius so i guess it's just clarifying that if gojo runs away from sukuna it's not not like the goalpost keeps moving, if that makes sense. But then we come back to the fight and Gojo activates Simple Domain, something we've never seen him use before. I mean, he hasn't really needed to use it. All of his fights have pretty much been squash matches up until this point. And Yuji's like, didn't Gojo say that he can't do that? And Kusagabe says, no, he said that he can't teach it. Natural geniuses can't teach for squat, which is very true even in real life. And it also, you know, goes back into what we heard from other natural geniuses in the series, such as Shoko. When Gojo asked her how to use reverse curse technique, she couldn't really explain it since it came naturally to her. I'm sure you yourself watching this probably are really skilled in at least something, and it just came naturally to you. Like, you didn't really have to practice. You can kind of just always do it. And if you try to explain it to someone, it's probably difficult or you can't really get your point across because you're just able to do it. Then we get some more exposition on how crazy of a genius Gojo really is. Because like we said, he's coming off of using his domain expansion, which is nerfing his curse technique for a time limit. But on top of that, he's constantly using reverse curse technique and using simple domain at the same time, all while regulating his cursed energy and not running out. And of course, fighting Sakuta hand to hand at the same time. But we're also finding out, according to Choso, that compared to a real domain, the cursed energy output for simple domain will merely just buy time. 
And we see that, yeah, it dissipates very quickly, allowing for Sukuna to just go through Gojo like butter with his slashing attacks again. As to where right after Gojo activates Simple Domain yet again, but at this point, something really interesting happens and Gojo stops healing himself with reverse curse technique. He's just allowing these wounds to fester and still going at Sukuna. And Akotsu, you know, ponders like, no, he couldn't have ran out of cursed energy because as we established with the six eyes on top of Gojo's talent, he's just really efficient at using cursed energy and it will replenish in theory faster than what he can expend. But in this case, it's a little different since he's going overdrive, you know, continually using reverse curse technique right after he activated his domain expansion. And this definitely isn't the case. He still does have cursed energy to spare, but he's not using reverse curse technique because he's been healing his own curse technique. Because like we said, after using the domain, your curse technique is, uh, as they say, burned out. And that Gojo is such a beast that he can use reverse curse technique to heal said burned out curse technique. So instead of just healing his wounds, he was healing his limitless curse technique, which, you know, he can do it. I know it's kind of weird to think about, but it makes sense, I guess, in the jujitsu world. And as soon as it comes back on, he like magnetically latches onto Sukuna in like a reverse backpack position and then aims his fingers at Sukuna's face point blank and uses his curse technique reversal red like his projectile blast attack that we've seen him use against Jogo and Doji, which, you know, as it says, is the reversed application of Limitless when you put reverse cursed energy into it instead of positive. Because as we've seen with blue, it's more of like a suction ability, but with red, it's more of a expulsion. And he blasts Sukuna point blank in the face after latching onto him. It wasn't like when he hit him with the hollow purple in the beginning where Sukuna at the last second was able to fester some kind of defense. It's like, no, he's taking this right on the face. But it does seem like Sukuna was able to move at least a little bit because I guess his head would have been taken off and it's definitely not here, but he did take some serious damage. And like I said before, he is blasted into the Malevolent Shrine and it seemingly is damaged here. And I wonder if that's going to play into maybe some kind of weakness here. Like maybe the commentary that we got from the sorcerers isn't exactly entirely reliable. Or maybe they're just speculating themselves and they don't entirely know. That has happened before in this series. But that's where the chapter ends with Gojo's comeback. He was down for the count and his back was seriously against the wall for most of this round, but he ends it strong. And I don't know how much this is really going to hurt Sukuna because, you know, he could just reverse curse technique back from this, but it did really wound him. And Sukuna's like smiling at it, but he's definitely like, yeah, you got me. And in the final panel, we see Gojo once again using reverse curse technique to heal from the wounds that that he allowed to linger while he was healing limitless and he's like that wasn't easy so yeah the fight is far from over guys we're going into i guess round four at this point all right so coming off of the previous chapter we saw gojo getting lit up by the malevolent shrine and in case you didn't watch my spoilers video let me also apologize here because for the last couple weeks i was saying the malevolent shrine had a radius of nearly 200 kilometers when it was actually meters and i'm sorry about that guys i did not mean to spread misinformation or anything like that i'm simply just an idiot i knew that it was meters because it says it on the page but for some reason my brain decided to say kilometers continuously over and over again because my brain is that of a chimps. So again, I am sorry. I will try not to make any mistakes in the future, but I can guarantee you guys that I eventually will for sure. But you'll be there in the comments. Call me out rightfully as you should. But anyway, Gojo decided to play some more 4D chess with Sukuna and somehow using reverse curse technique healed his own curse technique, Limitless, which has had that burnout refractory period. I don't even know if I could say that on YouTube, but in the context of Jujutsu Kaisen, it is very PG, I promise you, because he had used his domain expansion, of course. And, you know, after he used the domain expansion, you kind of have that period where you can't use your curse technique because, you know, Sukuna had chopped up the outside barrier of it. But somehow, Gojo was able to heal his exhausted curse technique. And this is even blowing the minds of the spectators, even Akotsu, who is, you know, one of the few geniuses in this world. I mean, despite him only really being like 
a little over a year in the game. He's like so knowledgeable somehow at this point where he's saying that he thought it was impossible to do this because so far we've just seen reverse curse technique used to heal like wounds and whatnot. But considering that this is Gojo, he can just do it because he's Gojo. He's like the Michael Jordan of jiu-jitsu. But there is definitely one above him and I'll go more into that later on, but Akotsu says that a curse technique that's been burned out by using a domain expansion is an entirely different matter than physical damage, just like when a machine overheats. Even if it isn't broken, you have to let it cool or it won't work. So this makes me think that Gojo is definitely getting to the point of diminished returns with his body and his jujitsu and cursed energy and everything. Like he can't keep going the way that he has been going for sure. And I think it will eventually catch up with him, but it hasn't yet. But then we see Gojo talking to Sukuna. He's like, you can expand your effective range, can't you? Because we find out that Sukuna expanded the range of his malevolent shrine to its maximum, which is like <laughs> 200 meters or close to it. And this inspires Gojo to activate his domain expansion once again, which is, you know, we were talking about, it's crazy that he's able to do this. Normally you can only really do the domain expansion once, but Gojo's not only doing it once, he's doing it twice on top of reverse curse techniquing continuously from all the damage that he had taken on top of healing his limitless curse technique. But it's a little different this time because Higuruma, another genius, chiming in here, and he says that he switches the internal and external conditions for the barrier. So this means that its exterior is stronger than it was before. Because, you know, as we saw previously, it was very vulnerable to Sukuna's slashing attacks because it was sitting inside of Sukuna's open domain. It wasn't closed and spherical the way that Gojo's is. And even Kusakabe is like, it seems a bit unfair that he could just change the conditions of his domain on the fly. And this is more so like Kusakabe being like a literal reader of this chapter because it is unfair, but it's like, we just have to go with it because Gojo is just that crazy. He's just that much of a freak or a genetic freak in the jujitsu world. Like he's truly an anomaly. One of the greatest sorcerers to ever exist. I mean, he has to be. And I'm talking even including the Hien era. So now Gojo's a little more confident since his domain is gonna be cracked from the outside instantly like it was before. And he goes into a quick hand-to-hand -hand exchange with Sukuna, but it turns out that Sukuna is pretty freaky himself. I mean, as we already know, because <laughs> On top of already having his domain expansion active, he's also using domain amplification at the same time within it. Even Gojo's like, you know, I, I guess it isn't impossible. Like there's just a lot of craziness going on because that's what you get when you see a fight between the two strongest sorcerers in history. Like they just start breaking the series. And I know I use that term loosely, especially with like Maki because she literally does with her heavenly restriction and other things that she could do within that spectrum. But these two are true truly breaking the series. And I'm really enjoying it. Like they're pushing the established power system that Gege has put out here to its max and using it like two experts truly would. And I'll get more into that, but I'm just enjoying this so much because everything for the most part makes sense aside from, you know, Gojo just doing things that we thought you couldn't, but we just have to go with it because it's not like bad, if that makes sense. It still is good. We just have to suspend our disbelief even more than it already is considering that that we are reading battle manga. So this means they're pretty much at a stalemate. Both domains are active, but neither are really affecting one another because of the contingencies and the counters that they put in place. So Sukuna isn't getting hit by infinite void because if he did, he'd probably be instantly defeated. It, I don't think it's a matter of like how powerful you are with that. Like once you get hit with that, your brain gets overloaded and you're pretty much done. So you have to do everything in your power to avoid it, or at least as far as we know. I mean, maybe full power 25 finger Sakuna in his true body could like muscle through it somehow because why not you know just because everything's impossible before this point but I wonder if we will see that but going forward after another brief physical exchange we see that Sakuna is just becoming the goat here if he wasn't already because he goes back to back with Gojo, similar to how they were in the very first episode in their first encounter, which I think Gege is paying homage to by paralleling it here maybe. But considering that Sukuna was inside of Yuji this whole time, you know, getting, as he says here, firsthand experience, he saw the last time that Gojo had used his domain expansion against Jogo. And he realized, as Kenjaku says here, that 
the only ones unaffected by Infinite Void are Gojo himself and the ones that are directly touching him. So now that Sukuna is directly touching him, he's unaffected by Infinite Void and he doesn't really have to use his domain amplification, I guess, because he wants to use his curse technique, or at least that's the implication here, because if he's activating domain amplification, he can't use it. But he goes even further here. And this sequence right here, I have to say is a 10 out of 10 battle manga sequence. Like this is what Hunter Hunter really should be in my opinion, and I'm not trying to start too much controversy with that, but Sukuna really does something incredible here. And it's just chef kiss because the exposition that we get from the narrator says, using a binding vow, Sukuna managed to further increase the power of his domain outside of Gojo's domain by removing the guaranteed hit inside. So while simultaneously keeping himself safe from the infinite void by touching Gojo, so he's able to break Gojo's domain because he's activating another binding vow here. I guess in his mind, he's just t saying it and it's activating because he's not saying it out loud, but he's removing the slashing attacks from inside. So there's no longer a threat in there. So it makes it, you know, a worthy binding vow. You have to give something to get something in return. But the attacks on the outside of the domain, the ones that would be attacking, you know, the outer sphere of Gojo's domain is severely increased in power. So now it's strong enough to overcome the reinforcement that Gojo placed on it in the beginning. And yes, he breaks it and then just starts lighting up Gojo once again. Like I said, just chef kiss sequence here. Sukuna fully utilizing the power system put in place here. This is just jujitsu at the very highest level. It's like watching the two best fighters or the two best athletes in our world going at it and putting on a masterclass. Everything is making sense for the most part. And I just can't praise this sequence enough. I wouldn't say that this chapter as a whole is a 10 out of 10 because it takes a lot for me to give that to a chapter. I think I've only given it to like five that I've reviewed so far in like like the four years that I've been doing this, almost five at this point. But this sequence is definitely a 10 out of 10. So another interesting thing happens after this, where Kashimo says that, you know, considering that Gojo just got lit up again and had his domain destroyed once again, he says, if he dies, referring to Gojo, I'm going out there next. Don't try to stop me. And this is super fascinating because while Kashimo on the surface would just get absolutely destroyed by Sukuna, I mean, he fought to a draw against Hikari. So naturally, you know, using jujitsu math, there's no way he would stand a chance against Sukuna, but he does have his curse technique, which is so powerful he can only use it once. And like I also said before, it ties into Hindu mythology, which Gojo is definitely paralleling to, where there's another character that can use like a lightning base attack. And I don't know, maybe my editor can punch in here exactly what I'm talking about if he knows, but not exactly sure if it's lightning, but they definitely have like a one time thing that they can do that can kill a god. And I'm pretty sure that's what Kashimo's thing is here. Like his curse technique is so powerful that he's just been saving it to use against Sukuna for sure. That's why he didn't use it against Hikari. And I think that it is so powerful that it can take out Sukuna. I mean, I don't think he's gonna kill him, but he might mess him up if he does get a chance to cleanly hit him with it. But anyway, back to the battle and Gojo is just eating this up. I mean, he's still getting cut, but not as bad as before. Like it was implied that the cuts were going directly through him, like Sukuna slashing attacks from his domain. But now Gojo is digging really deep into his toolbox here because he's using falling blossom emotion. We saw this before from now Bito when he was in Dagon's domain back in the Shibuya arc. It's similar to domain amplification, except that it doesn't just shut down things. It kind of just attacks the instant hits by coating yourself in cursed energy, essentially. Or as Kusakabe says, it's an amplification of cursed energy that automatically repels anything you touch. So he is repelling Sukuna slashing attacks here, but it's not strong enough to just completely nullify them. So he is taking them, but it's kind of just like surface level cuts. So he'll be all right. But while he's using this, he's also able to use reverse curse technique to heal his burnout curse technique, just like he did in the previous chapter, coming into this one as well. So both Gojo and Sukuna are really going all out, using jujitsu to its highest level in such a really, really cool way where for the time being, we're only really gonna be able to see these two characters pull off stuff like this, unless we go back to an Hien era flashback, where it's kind of implied that that there was at least 10 people on this level or something like that. I'm just throwing a number out there, but considering how powerful Yorozu was, I don't think that was the tip of the iceberg. But coming into the end of the chapter, Gojo activates his domain expansion again. 
But now that he's failed twice, I guess it's gonna be three times a charm because he figures out that instead of just reinforcing the outside of it, he just decides to make his own domain barrier as large as Sukuna's. So now he doesn't have to worry about it getting hit by slash attacks because it's taking up the entire radius. And yeah, I know, how's he doing that? He's Gojo. Okay, he's just a freak, like we were talking about. He's just able to do this, but it doesn't stop there. He somehow just shrinks it down and it becomes like the size of a basketball, but it consumes everything, including Sukuna, Gojo, and the Malevolent Shrine. And that's where the chapter ends, with it saying a battle between the strongest becomes more dense. So what happens here is anybody's guess. I mean, he's kind of creating almost like a singularity here. And I wonder if that's what his goal is. I mean, I don't think he's completely crushed himself and Sukuna. They're probably still just perfectly fine alive in there, but the space has just altered into becoming so dense and small, but I'm sure it seems normal to them. And yeah, like I said before, this could be creating some kind of singularity or something, or this could be what Gojo's maximum technique is. I mean, we've been talking about this for a while. Like, what is it? Like, we haven't seen it yet. And I know that he is activating his domain here, but maybe that's tied to it. And it's not unlike Gege to be pulling out these, you know, singularity-based attacks. We have seen it from Yorozu and Sukumo. So this could be the trifecta here, and Gojo does literally create a, like a, even more of a black hole or a event horizon or a singularity the way that Sukumo was possibly. Or he's just trying to take them both out. So the battle between Gojo and Sukuna is continuing as we saw Gojo shrink his domain expansion down to even smaller than a basketball containing not only Sukuna and himself, but also the Malevolent Shrine. This is one of Gojo's many attempts to thwart Sukuna's domain expansion as he's been unsuccessful two times previous to this since he's essentially just a bad matchup to Sukuna. Since Sukuna's domain is open and can attack from the outside and Gojo's barrier is more traditional as to where it closes in its spherical shape but it's kind of just a sitting duck inside of Sukuna's open domain. We also see the sorcerers giving commentary as they're watching as usual, and they have their own theories as to what's going on here. But we eventually find out through Chozo that Gojo was able to manipulate his domain this way from his time in the prison realm. I guess being trapped in the prison realm allowed him to understand how it worked, since it did manipulate space and time. And that's essentially what Limitless does, aside from the time stuff, or it remains to be seen, but Limitless essentially just manipulates space. So it's understandable that Gojo would be able to apply the fundamentals of the prison realm to his own domain expansion or just how the parameters of it would work, since it all is just jujitsu in the end. But the prison realm is more an innate technique of Genshin. Whoever that guy was, hopefully he comes back. Probably not. But going further, Kusakabe says that, even knowing that, I still don't get how he can change the conditions of his domain every time he uses it. And Miwa, speaking as somewhat of a surrogate of the audience, says, you've been saying that a lot, and what does that even mean? And he says barriers, particularly domain barriers, typically have set interval and external parameters like volume and creation speed. And by discovering their own blend of these parameters, every sorcerer is able to establish their own barrier. So this essentially means that when you're a sorcerer and you create your domain expansion or develop it, it kind of has like its own set dimensions to it. Like it's only going to be this big, it's only going to be created at this speed, and it's only going to work in a set parameter of functions. And it's kind of just stuck that way. Like once you make it, it's pretty much done and it's always essentially Essentially going to be the same way once you've fully completed it. Like, think about making a house or something, but then you can't expand upon it. It's kind of just stuck that way. But it's still pretty effective and it does its job. However, just with Gojo and Sukuna, they're above that. Because as we've seen on the fly, they've been manipulating their domains, which is just unheard of. Like, changing the conditions of it, as we saw with Gojo, once he figured out that he was being attacked from the outside, he immediately changed the conditions to reinforce the durability of the outside of his domain. And we saw that Sukuna, on the other hand, also altered the conditions of his domain by cutting off his slashing attacks from the inside in order to make his slashing attack from the outside more powerful to compensate for the durability increase that Gojo applied. Not to mention the whole thing about making them bigger and smaller, you know, nearly 200 meters in a radius, which is just insane. And it's like, we're only really going to be able to see this stuff from Gojo and Sukuna or maybe some other strong characters that we 
haven't been introduced to yet. But all of this stuff is just only applicable to the very highest level of jujitsu. And I'm sure some people have had issues with this saying that, oh, it doesn't make sense or it wasn't established before. And it's like, it was. It's just that we weren't thinking outside of the box so much. And it's like, guys, I would be the first one to call out a manga and stuff like this. But with Jujutsu Kaisen or with Gege in this instance, I really can't because it's all making sense to me at least. We haven't seen anyone on this level yet, especially two fighting it out. So it's understandable that they're going to be able to do stuff like this. I mean, in sports, when we see people at the highest level go at it, they discover or we discover new things through their super high level of application. I mean, come on. But anyway, Hikari and Higuruma are surprised by this. The whole thing about, you know, domains having set internal and external parameters. And Kusakabe says, uh, you guys are the exceptions. Your domains open by default as part of your curse techniques. And that's fascinating. I didn't really think about that before. Not necessarily with Higuruma. We kind of knew that. His deadly sentencing domain expansion is kind of like his main ability. Like, that's just what he does. It's like his curse technique is kind of one and the same of his domain expansion that makes sense. I mean, yes, he can use the gavel from deadly sentencing, kind of like a cursed tool, but that's just more an extension of what his full package ability is. And I guess the same could be said for Hikari, which I was kind of confused about. Because back when I was covering his fight against Kashimo, I was wondering why he wasn't using just his innate curse technique, you know, like what we saw him do against Yuji, where he just summoned like the doors from the train and like trapped him in them. But I guess it works the same way as Higuruma, as to where he can just use aspects of what his domain expansion has instead of just fully activating the domain expansion, because that is the same as him using his full-blown curse technique. That's just how it works with them. Because when Hikari was fighting Kashimo, he always used his domain expansion, Idle Death Gamble. And it's because he has to. His curse technique and domain expansion are one and the same. But as for him just like using aspects of it without pulling out the domain, I guess that's just part of it. Or at least that's the way that I see it here. And that's pretty cool. It's different, you know, than what we see with like the Ten Shadows or Limitless or Projection Sorcery as to where they're more reliant on just using their techniques. And then the domain expansion is kind of like what they do as like a last resort or their main event, if you will, aside from their maximum technique. But going further, we see that Gojo's domain is about to break. And Akotsu says that Sukuna also decreased his domain's range so he could increase the output of his cursed technique. And yeah, once again, Sukuna has changed the conditions. I guess he performed another binding vow, like we talked about. I guess you could just do this in your head, like you don't necessarily have to say it out loud. And I'm thinking back to Hunter Hunter, and I guess like they don't have to say like the Nen contracts out loud as well. I mean, sometimes they do if they're making it with someone. You know, the same thing with Jujutsu Kaisen, but if it's just like a personal binding vow or Nen contract, I guess you could just do it in your head, because why not? But Sukuna also decreased his domain's range since he saw that Gojo did the same by compressing them in to a freaking basketball. But now that Sukuna has done this, he has also broken Gojo's barrier outside of his domain once again for the third freaking time. But on the other hand, Gojo got a super clean shot in on Sukuna. He pierced his chest somehow. I don't know what he did. We are not privy to it. Maybe he shot him with red. Not really sure. But this damaged Sukuna enough to finally break his domain as well. So they both simultaneously came down. But to be honest, I think this is what Sukuna Sukuna ultimately wanted, or he doesn't seem too upset about this. We'll talk about that later. But now that both of their domains have broken, they're unable to use their curse techniques, you know, because of the burnout period that they have. But as we found out, Gojo can heal his burnt out curse technique with reverse curse technique. Something we didn't know before, but like I said, these guys are freaks at the highest level of jiu-jitsu, and they're able to do things that we just didn't understand before or thought were impossible, similar to the characters that are watching. However, as Angel says, he made the mistake of showing that to Sukuna. Because it turns out that Sukuna might be even more of a freak than Gojo. And he's kind of the same as Garo from One Punch Man? Because Sukuna just needs to see something performed once and then he can copy it. I mean, not like an innate ability. It's not like he can use Limitless or something like that. But as long as it falls into the realms of like Jujitsu and just the manipulation of it, he can do it. So Sukuna is essentially going to do the same thing. He's going to heal his own Bertha curse technique with reverse curse technique as well. But not only that, Angel also says that with Kenjaku's help, Sukuna was able to split his spirit or soul, depending on what translation you're following, into 
20 cursed objects, the fingers. And after seeing it just once, he learned how to turn himself into a cursed object, so this is pretty insightful. I don't really think we knew this before. This is how Kenjaku was able to make cursed objects and have the sorcerers reincarnate later on. He took their freaking souls and put them into, I don't know what the other cursed objects were, but for Sukuna, it was his 20 fingers. 20 fingers, of course, because he had four arms. And I don't know if you necessarily need to do it into 20 fingers because Sukuna, after learning this from Kenjaku, you know, I guess a thousand years ago, he most recently did it, of course, when he transferred his soul to to Yuji's pinky and then force fed himself to Megumi and took him over. But considering that he only did that with one finger, I'm not sure why he needed to do it with 20 before. Maybe because his soul was so big or something, or maybe it was just a contingency to make sure that even if, you know, some of the fingers were destroyed or something, one would survive and then that's all he would need or something. It doesn't really seem that that's the case. It does seem like he needs all 20 fingers to become whole again, obviously. But again, we haven't really seen how it happened with the other sorcerers being reincarnated. They kind of just appeared and that's it we don't know what cursed objects they needed or the process that was done to them necessarily other than their soul being pulled from them and put into a cursed object we've only really seen it happen with the curse womb death paintings but that's different because they were cursed wombs but hopefully we get that he and era flashback that i've been talking about for so long i really hope that gege decides to go full oda with that you know because when oda in one piece decides to finally go into an important flashback he dedicates time to it like over 10 chapters sometimes and i really think that the hienera needs that i don't think one chapter would do it justice but after this gojo and sukuna go into kind of just a vanilla fight like they're not using any abilities or jiu-jitsu or anything it's kind of just like a standard heavy hitter battle manga fight for the most part and gojo knocks sukuna away and we go into a rare inner monologue from him and he says this whole time sukuna has been stubbornly avoiding using any other curse technique other than the one granted to his domain. That's interesting wording there, granted to his domain. Does this mean that Gojo knows that Sukuna's cleave and dismantle possibly aren't his innate abilities? I mean, Gojo would, in theory, be able to see this with his six eyes, since using that, he can understand how someone's curse technique works. So maybe he does know, you know, the theory that the fandom has had for a while that Sukuna's innate ability is like shrine or malevolent shrine, where he kind of just can add abilities or curse techniques to it aside from just having like a standard thing like you know cleave dismantle the fire arrow and whatever else he has or maybe i'm just reading too much into this but regardless i'm pretty sure that cleave and dismantle are in his innate abilities but going further he says in spite of all that why didn't sakuna try to use the 10 shadows technique or maharaga inside the domain and that's something we've been asking for a while it's like why hasn't sakuna been using the 10 shadows i guess there is a specific reason to it and going further gojo says sakuna has the memory of megumi my conversation so he knows I know about Maharaga, doesn't he? Or is he scared that I'll beat it with a single attack? So that's really interesting because Gojo did talk to Megumi about Maharaga, although he didn't literally outright say it, at least on the page, but the conversation implied that he did. And he also told Megumi that like, I think 400 years ago, I think it was or something like that, that the heads of the Gojo and Zenin clan fought against each other to the death in front of the hierarchy. And the Gojo clan leader had the six eyes and limitless and the Zenin clan leader had the Ten Shadows. So I assume that Maharaga was used in that battle for sure. Now, as for him saying, is he scared I'll beat it with a single attack? That makes sense because that's your best chance of defeating Maharaga. You kind of just have to defeat him immediately because he has the ability to adapt to any and all phenomena, as it says. Meaning that if you use like a certain ability or technique on him and he survives it, his Dharma Chakra, the wheel above him, will spin and then he'll adapt to it. And then you're pretty much screwed after that. And I'm pretty Pretty sure Sukuna could defeat him with one single attack if he wanted to, and Sukuna probably does know that. And coming into the final panels of this chapter, we see the Dharma Chakra spin, indicating that he has adapted to something. And Gojo sees this because it says, what do those eyes see through? And I guess using his six eyes, he can see that Sukuna has been using the Dharma Chakra, even though the audience hasn't seen it. And we found out that Sukuna can do this for some reason, because back in his fight against Yorozu, he summoned the Dharma Chakra without using Maharaga. And he used that to be able to adapt to Yorozu's ability. So I guess this is just like a nuanced application of the Ten Shadows. Maybe he could just use aspects of the Shikigami without fully bringing them out. And with 
Maharaga's ability, this is an expert play on Sukuna. He just brings out the Dharma Chakra, takes an attack from Gojo, whatever it was, whether he's being hit by just pure limitless here or the red or blue or whatever, adapting to that. Then he brings out Maharaga and the Dharma Chakra goes to him, but now it has like the built-in adaptability to limitless or whatever was used against him. So now Maharaga doesn't have to worry about getting hit with it in the first place because he's already adapted to it, if that makes sense. Which I think Sukuna is going to do here for sure. And I'm not really sure the full complexity of this. Like if he gets hit by limitless, does it mean that he's become adapted to all aspects of it? Like red, blue, purple, even if he wasn't hit with them, just because he was hit with limitless, does that mean that he's now invulnerable to them? Not really sure. I mean, maybe we'll find that in the next chapter, but I'm pretty sure that's what Sukuna's play is here. Take the hit for Maharaga, adapt to it, and then pass the Dharma Chakra to him. So now he's just this big, unbeatable beast, essentially. Well, not necessarily against Gojo, but against anyone else. This is like checkmate for sure. Now, coming to the final panel, once Gojo, I assume, recognizes what I just said, like he realized what Sukuna's whole deal was here, he's like, tisk. And then we see blood coming down from his nose. And I'm pretty sure this is Gojo nearing his limit. Like even the massive freak that Gojo is even has his limits. He's not omnipotent. And as we've seen, he's used his domain expansion three times so far. We've never seen anyone use it more than once in the series. And Gojo has done it three times so far on top of using reverse curse technique perpetually to heal not only his wounds from Cleave and Dismantle, but he also has to constantly heal his brain from using the six eyes. Even though it's kind of minuscule, he's still using it. But on top of that, he's been using reverse curse technique to heal his burnout curse technique. He's been using simple domain, falling, blossom emotion. On top of that, he came out right out of the gates with a, you know, hollow purple, been using other applications of it, you know, red, blue. He has to be coming to his limits soon. And Sukuna, on the other hand, hasn't really been using that much of an output. He's kind of just been outplaying Sukuna this whole time by using, you know, less cursed energy. And this is just expert play from Sukuna. He's kind of just had the upper hand the whole time, to be honest. Honest. He's been forcing Gojo to exhaust himself, which is what great fighters do. Like if you're going against a heavy hitter, you know, you just sit back, guard yourself, you know, stay moving, move away from their power side. You know, if they're like orthodox, you move away from their right hand. Or if they're southpaw, you move away from their left hand and you just counter when you can, you know, jab and parry or whatever, and just wear them down because, you know, these big heavy power hitters, they're only going to last for a couple rounds. And then once you get into like round four, or five, or, you know, if you're in MMA, if you just get it around two or three, they're pretty much gassed at this point. And since, you know, the counter conservative fighter has been holding back and waiting for their chance, then they just dominate them once they've exhausted themselves. And I think that was what we're seeing here with Gojo and Sukuna here. Gojo has exhausted himself trying to be Sukuna, but Sukuna is just too smart for it. And now I'm thinking he's really going to dominate Gojo at this point once he pulls out Maharaga. But that's not the end of the fight, of course. There will still be more than this. I'm sure Gojo has another trick up his sleeve. But first, let's talk about gamer subs. Guys, did I tell you that I love gamer subs because, you know, they like sponsor me, but also if you haven't tried it yet, you definitely should I'll take a shot. Guys, this is a big one because Gamer Subs is officially collaborating with Jujitsu Kaisen. That's right. And they're coming out with a flavor called Cursed Energy. It comes in both caffeine and caffeine free. Both will give you the energy and focus that you know and love from Gamer Subs. Not only that, but they also got a bunch of shaker cups as well featuring Yuji, Sukuna, Gojo, Megumi, and Nobara. I am so excited for this, guys. But back to me at Anime Expo. Link in the description. Code Big Z. Everyone listening. Code Big Z. <laughs> Code Big Z. Code Big Z. Code Big Z. Code Big Z. <laughs> So the chapter opens up with us seeing Gojo and Sukuna activating their domain expansions for the fourth time. Also, Gojo just wiping the blood off of his nose because at the end of the previous chapter, we saw that he started to bleed from it. In my opinion, this is showing that Gojo is getting to an exhaustion point. As I mentioned, this is the fourth time he's used his domain expansion, but on top of that, he's been using reverse curse technique, healing not only himself, but also his burnt out curse technique, which we're gonna get into. But on top of that, just Gojo inherently is always kind of running at full power, essentially having the six eyes. And that's why he wears the 
blindfold because it's like sensory overload. And it was also said at some point that he also has to like always kind of micro reverse curse technique his brain because of that too. So everything that's been going on in this battle, he is almost running on empty at this point. Like burning the candle at both ends is an understatement. So I feel like Gojo definitely knows that. He's aware of it. He's playing it off coolly here. You know, not letting Sukuna know that he is coming to his limit. But we're going to see that that's why Gojo is fighting so aggressively at this point and trying to rush the finish. Because he's essentially on a time limit. But like I was saying about healing the burnt out curse technique after using a domain expansion with reverse curse technique, it is confirmed that Sukuna could do that here because we see them both activating their domains immediately once again after, you know, coming off the previous chapter where both of their domains had broken at the same time. But the question is, is like, could he always do that or did he just learn it from Gojo? And he, I don't know, maybe he learned it from Gojo because that was also insinuated in the previous chapter that Sukuna is like a super genius that has ridiculous muscle memory adaptability kind of like Garo from One Punch Man but anyway Kusakabe says that during the three minutes of Sukuna destroying Gojo's domain from the outside Gojo will have to deal damage so that Sukuna can't maintain his own domain so yeah Gojo's realized that like three times now his domain has been destroyed by Sukuna from attacking from the outside because that's how it's vulnerable regardless of how much he's changing conditions so he's going to stop just changing conditions and trying to alter his domain to comply with what Sukuna is doing he's just bum rushing him going out with like gatling fists chasing him all over beating him down successfully like using blue it looks like sending him into the malevolent shrine and just continuing to beat him down to the point of where both of their domains are breaking at the same time once again and the outcome we see the left part of sukuna's face is like burnt off i assume he got hit with red here or something we don't see what happened but maybe it was maybe it wasn't but he really got messed up by this and that just further shows how gojo was able to mitigate his domain getting destroyed first like it was in the previous rounds he's just having them both getting destroyed at the same time but this is actually a really good move by sakuna because it puts sakuna at a severe disadvantage in this sequence because they once again activate their domains for the fifth time however because sakuna had to heal that damage that he just took on the left side of his face it put him at like a 0.1 deficit behind gojo so this means that gojo has successfully activated his domain main first because he didn't have to worry about healing himself or anything this time all he had to do was just heal his burnt out curse technique as to where Sukuna had to heal himself you know the his face and then heal his burnt out curse technique and then activate his domain so now he's 0 0.01 seconds behind but that's enough because in this super high level battle of jujitsu it's a game of inches and now Gojo has the upper hand and he just hits Sukuna instantly in the chest and it says that after two minutes and 40 seconds Sukuna's domain collapses you know the malevolent shrine and then he gets hit with unlimited void finally we're seeing Sukuna get hit by the unlimited void here we've been wondering what was going to happen with this when's it going to happen how is he going to react to it and he seems to be just as susceptible as anyone else like he can't muscle through this or just fight it off like once you get hit by unlimited void and your brain gets overloaded with the information that it feeds you or however it works you're done you're putting like cantonic state and as gojo's going after him he's like i'm gonna crush your heart and lungs and liver and i'm gonna bring him closer to death than yuji at the juvenile training school you know call back to the first season of course but i think this is also further alluding to the fact that gojo can perform reverse curse technique on other people which is something that is you know kind of rare only shoko and akotsu have done it so far i think i don't know maybe i missed somebody else who've done it but it goes back to when this fight started when gojo was saying like i did some training or he figured out some things so he can just fully go all out on megumi because you know we can't forget that sukuna is inhabiting megumi's body right now and megumi is you know held very close to gojo's heart he's kind of like his nephew so if he's gonna go all out on him and like crush his heart and lungs then i'm sure he knows that he can heal him at some point he's not just gonna kill megumi here just to kill sukuna even though technically it would be for the greater good, but we obviously know that Gojo is above that. But you can't count Sukuna out. He always has an answer for everything. Even after being 
being hit with Unlimited Void, he somehow summons Maharaga. Like, we've been waiting for this because we knew in the previous chapter that he had the Dharma Chakra active, you know, the wheel that goes above Maharaga. And we saw in Sukuna's fight against Yorozu that he was doing the same thing. Like, he was able to have the Dharma Chakra active, but not summon Maharaga. So what he's essentially doing is, I guess, fully utilizing one of the nuanced aspects of the Ten Shadows as to where he can pull out one of the abilities of, like, the Shikigamis, but not fully summon them. Or at least maybe just in Maharaga's case, where he could just pull out the Dharma Chakra and then take the hits for him. Because Maharaga's ability is that he can adapt to any phenomena or whatever the translation is. Like if he gets hit with some kind of ability or something or a technique or whatever, he'll adapt to it and then he's invulnerable to it. And I guess this fundamental applies to the Dharma Chakra itself. So Sukuna has the Dharma Chakra active on him and then he takes the hit and then passes it on to Maharaga. So then Maharaga then becomes invulnerable himself. And it's like, where has the Dharma Chakra been this whole time? Because we saw it visibly above Sukuna when he was fighting Yorozu, but against Gojo, we didn't see it. And it was implied that Gojo could see it with his six eyes, possibly. But I guess Sukuna, like, stored the Dharma Chakra in the Ten Shadows realm itself, but somehow still had it active on him, I guess. Or he made it invisible or something. I don't know. Maybe he just stored it in the Ten Shadows, kind of like a pocket dimension or something. But yeah, that's what happened here. Him getting hit with Unlimited Void was kind of like a trap for Gojo, I guess. Because he took the hit from Maharaga while the Dharma Chakra was active passed it on to Maharaga, so now Maharaga is immune to Unlimited Void, you know, the short hit of Gojo's domain expansion, which was Gojo's, like, big out here, because Gojo needed to defeat Maharaga in one hit, and hitting him with Unlimited Void surely would have ended him. I mean, I don't know how Unlimited Void would deal with Shikigamis. I think that Gege said curses deal with Unlimited Void different than humans because they have less brain activity or less brain capacity or something like that. I mean, obviously it wrecked Jogo, but he was like, you know, one of the more intelligent curses, obviously. But as for Maharaga, I don't know how intelligent he is. I don't even know if he could speak, but at least he can acknowledge situations and smile because he's definitely smiling at the end of this chapter, which is hilarious. But Maharaga is an absolute beast. I mean, we already knew it. He was kind of downplayed because he was defeated by Sukuna in Shibuya. But then again, that was a Maharaga that was summoned by Megumi. And I don't know how altered the power becomes because it seems like Maharaga is just an entity as himself. But technically he was tamed by Sukuna. So maybe his full power has come out here and he breaks Gojo's domain expansion with his sword, his sword that is coded in positive cursed energy at all times. We've never seen this before. This is like unheard of. Like you have to be the biggest beast ever to be able to just break a domain expansion from the inside. You know, like we've been following this fight, we've seen that Sukuna was always breaking it from the outside because that's where domains are vulnerable. But Maharaga's like, nah, I ain't got time for that. He just stabs it, breaks it from the inside. And while this is happening, Gojo's trying to hit him with a curse technique reversal red, I assume. You know, trying to hit him in one shot. But no, he just breaks it and just kind of stifles Gojo here. And then this comes to the sequence where we see Maharaga smiling at him. Because he's like, yeah, you're screwed now, boy. But this brings the question it's like is Maharaga like adapted to all of Limitless or was he just adapted to the sure hit of Unlimited Void and it's like what did Sukuna adapt to at the end of the previous chapter as well because we saw the Dharma Chakra spin so either he's adapted to Red or whatever he got hit with not really sure if it was just Limitless because even if it was just Limitless I don't know if that means that he's fully adapted to all aspects of it you know like Red, Blue, Purple but regardless Gojo is in serious trouble here and I cannot wait to see him take on Maharaga. And I wonder what's going on with Sukuna because now that the domain expansion is broken, I guess he's no longer under unlimited void. And I'm sure he could just reverse curse technique his brain to heal it if it was damaged. I mean, if Jogo can survive it by just being ahead, I'm sure Sukuna can survive it as well. I don't think this is necessarily the direct end for Gojo here because he still does have some tricks up his sleeve. And like I said in the beginning, he is on a time limit, but I think this might be where he pulls out his maximum technique. Technique. 
if he does have one. I mean, kind of has to have one, unless it's purple. I don't think it's purple. Unless he does some kind of mega purple or something, like even more than what he did at the beginning of the fight with 200%. But I'm sure that he has another trick up his sleeve besides that maybe, but also Sukuna has another trick up his sleeve as well, because he has something that Yorozu gave him. Like as Yorozu was dying, she constructed one last thing with her curse technique construction. And I assume that's supposed to parallel the sequence between Mai and Maki. As Mai was dying, she constructed the soul splitting sword for Maki. And this could be something similar. I mean, I don't think she's giving him a soul splitting sword, but she's giving him something and I think it's going to come into play here. And that's how Sukuna might ultimately defeat Gojo. So coming off of the previous chapter, we saw that Sukuna summoned Maharaga inside of Gojo's domain while Sukuna took the shore hit on limited void using the Dharma Chakra so that he could pass it on to Maharaga so that he can become adapted to it, rendering the technique and Gojo's domain useless. And after breaking the domain, that brings us to the beginning of this chapter where we see Meimei saying, that's Maharaga, the trump card of the Zenin clan. And we see Choso say the Shigigami that can adapt to many kinds of attacks. And that's interesting, the way that it's phrased here, trump card of the Zenin clan, as if it was planned that they used him in some way, which is really hard to understand because we don't fully know how the Ten Shadows works. Like, where are these Shigigami coming from exactly? Like, do you create them or do they always exist? And the Ten Shadows, as it says, you know, the shadows that it manipulates is an intermediary for the Shigigami. It's like they always exist somewhere out there in the other world the curse realm or whatever and the ten shadows like summons them or it has the ability to bring them through to the human world and it is possible it works like that since gege is heavily inspired by togashi more so hunter hunter but togashi also made yu yu Hakusho. and if you remember hiei had the dragon of the darkness flame where he was able to do something similar to the concept that I'm talking about here where he would use that technique to basically bait the dragon of the darkness flame from spirit world and then use its power in the human world but going further it pretty much explains what we've been talking about these last two weeks with sukuna taking the hit from unlimited void with the dharma chakra activated so that he could pass it on to maharaga so that he would become adapted to it without having to take the hit himself because Maharaga probably wouldn't be able to survive getting hit with Unlimited Void the way that Sukuna would. But now we're getting another layer to that whole sequence because it wasn't actually Sukuna who took that hit initially, it was actually Megumi's soul. So the way that I see this sequence, or, or from what I can gather from what's being explained here, is that instantly he switched himself with Megumi's soul. So like think about when Yuji and Sukuna trade consciousness. I think he did that with Megumi for like a second, just long enough for him to take the unlimited void hit and then swapped him back out. So Megumi was the one who was using the Dharma Chakra in that instance, taking the hit so that he could pass it on to Maharaga, which in theory would leave Sukuna hitless. So he doesn't take the damage, even though that turns out that that's not the case, but I don't think this means that Megumi was hurt. More so his body, of course, but I think his soul's fine. Also, us seeing his soul here, I think further means that he is going to come back at some point. If killing Sumiki didn't completely destroy his soul or whatever, then I guess there's still a chance for him to come back, of course. Which I think is very likely. Then we see Sukuna, like, put Maharaga back in the shadows. And I'm confused by this. I don't know why he doesn't leave Maharaga out and then double team Gojo. Like, he has such an advantage right now, and he's just putting Maharaga back. And it's not really explained or talked about in this chapter so i just have to assume that maybe it's too taxizing on cursed energy to leave him out or something i mean there is a reason why i mean maharaga isn't completely going away permanently like he says that he's going to use him to adapt to infinite void again if gojo is able to use his domain expansion but i just don't know why he's using it in such a utilitarian manner why not just leave him out and double team gojo still confused by this but this is not the end of of Maharaga like he will come back out again 
Because going further, Sukuna says to Gojo, they're like, yeah, infinite void is what I was really worried about, but you know, it's only a curse technique that can be activated inside of your domain. And I really wanted to get rid of that card. So that's why he was baiting him out this whole time, not using Maharaga or the 10 shadows. He wanted to wait till the point of where Gojo was able to hit him with infinite void so that he can activate it and then later lead us to the sequence that we were going into now. But then he says, while I wasn't using domain amplification, I had Fushigoro Megumi adapt using the 10 shadows. Thanks to that, I wasn't able to use a curse technique other than that, which was a applied to the domain, but it seems like I had enough return for it. So again, there's like subtle implications about Sukuna's curse technique here, saying curse technique other than that was applied to the domain. Like, I think the way that his curse technique and domain expansion work is that he has to apply curse techniques to it from what I assume is the many curse techniques that he has. So I guess he figured that putting Cleave and Dismantle on Malevolent Shrine is just a really good combo. But I guess in theory, it also means that he could put the fire arrow on there as well, which I don't know why he doesn't. Like it could just rain fire arrows. That would be incredible. Not to mention the other things that Sukuna may or may not have, but we'll go more into that because I think it's teased again later on. But Gojo says what was taken over is the process to adapt, not the result. It doesn't mean that you had Megumi's soul adapt to Infinite Void. If I use Domain Expansion again, you have no other option than to summon Maharaga, and that's very true. But him saying the process to adapt and not the result, I think is foreshadowing as to what comes later on in the chapter, because like I was saying before, I don't think Megumi took damage. I mean, his soul at least. I mean, his body does, because that's what the result is here. He took the process to adapt, but the result is the result residual damage that he receives from having infinite void flood his brain like it's not like that damage doesn't go anywhere like it's still there as we're going to come to see but speaking of damage gojo tries to activate his domain expansion once again for the sixth time but he's unable to do it and he starts bleeding from the nose and everyone's freaking out Sukuna's like yeah you're recovering your burnt out curse technique with reverse curse technique which he's done five times at this point and then Sukuna says the curse technique is engraved around the prefrontal cortex of your right brain I think this is the only time we've ever heard this in the series. Getting so specific as to where the curse technique is. We knew it was in the brain, but not this specific. And it makes me wonder if this is how Sukuna and Kenjaku are able to have multiple curse techniques. They're like altering their brains. Now, how they're getting the curse technique in the first place, I don't really know. It could be something to do with blood or whatever, but I do think it has something to do with a biological aspect, but they're putting these multiple curse techniques in the prefrontal cortex of the right brains. Well, at least with Kenjaku, I think that's what's happening. But with Sukuna, it could be different because his innate ability could just be the ability to have multiple abilities. <laughs> but going further, he says, you destroyed your brain and restored it with reverse curse technique, you know, in order to heal the burnt out curse technique from using a domain. And and that's an incredibly taxizing thing to do, which has led Gojo to becoming exhausted. And if it was like a lesser sorcerer, he could have just straight up died from doing this. And going further, Kusakabe says the brain, especially that part that relates with the curse technique is a black box. That's fascinating, right? Because it is highly speculated that Sukuna's curse technique is black box. Like when he decides to use his flame arrow against Jogo, we see in his dialogue bubble that it is a black box. Now it could mean multiple things. The leading theory is that it relates to Gege's previous work that he made before Jujutsu Kaisen, where the main character was able to use like a black box and it had different weapons and stuff. And the way that he summoned it along with the dialogue box was the same that Sukuna uses against Jogo. So I think that is like a little wink at the audience here. But at this point, Sukuna pretty much thinks that he has Gojo on the ropes because he realizes he reached the point of where he can't use domain expansion anymore. And he says, next, I'll close my domain with a barrier. There is no escape. And I love how Sukuna can just manipulate his domain on the fly just the way that Gojo can, because obviously Sukuna's domain is known for being open, but if he closes it with a barrier, I guess this means that Gojo can't teleport out of there or, you know, use Limitless to warp space so that he can move around the way that he does. You'd think that he'd be able to do it outside of the domain, but I guess the jujitsu just stifles it. And then he also summons the Dharma Chakra again. And he says, all I have to do is cut you and adapt to Limitless. So he has everything set up to defeat Gojo here. And he says this awesome line, like, see his strongest. A guy that was just born when I didn't exist. That really is a great line. I love it so much. And as Sukuna activates his domain, it just explodes immediately and he starts bleeding from his eyes. 
And the narrator says that Sukuna endured Infinite Void for less than 10 seconds, but like Gojo, his brain was damaged to the point he couldn't expand his domain. So yeah, I think this goes back to what Gojo was saying. What was taken over is the process to adapt, not the result. The result is the damage here. Like a brain of their vessel, Megumi and Sukuna did take damage from Infinite Void on top of him healing his burnt out curse technique four times. So even Sukuna has his limits, of course. I don't know if his original body with the four arms would have reached this limit so fast but it's possible that he's limited because he's using Megumi's brain after all but nonetheless they're both reaching a similar limit here and Gojo's getting his confidence back but Sukuna's still smiling ready to fight knowing that he is reaching his limit as well and the chapter ends with us going back into another striking exchange with Gojo getting the better of Sukuna which we actually talked about last week Mino operator and Diavolo about how Gojo is definitely the superior Mar martial artist of the two by far and i guess since they're both burnt out on their domain expansions this will more so go into gojo's favor since it seems like they're going to have to rely more on striking now so coming off the end of the previous chapter we saw that gojo and sukuna had reached their limit of being able to use domain expansions anymore they just damaged their brains so much over the course of this battle that they've reached this limit of like exhaustion so going forward they're going to be fighting more physically i guess you could say and in the beginning of this chapter we see kusakabe asking anyone if they've received a serious punch from gojo and we find out that akotsu and hikari have this makes sense because before you know we came into the story with yuji and them akotsu and hikari were both students at jujitsu high the same as yuji and megumi are akotsu a second year and hikari a third year but we also know that gojo trained them at some point i don't know how long he trained them but he did and at some point he hit both of them with Limitless. So they know what it's like firsthand. And Kusakabe explains that Gojo overlaps the blue effect of Limitless. Like when he enhances Limitless with Curse Energy, it creates like this vacuum effect. So he says he overlaps that with his punch that's enhanced by Cursed Energy. So I'm assuming this means that like right before he makes a connection with you, throwing a punch, he pulls you in with blue, like coming from the fist, and then it hits you at the last second. And then his fist actually makes contact at the last second, so it's like a super punch. I guess that's what he's trying to get across here because Akari says, you know, when you're getting hit by it, it feels like it's a counter as opposed to like a normal punch. Then Yuji says that Nanami said the same thing. And then we go to this flashback with Nanami where they're in the back of a car and he's basically saying like, don't compare yourself to Gojo. Like his punch like jabs are like my criticals. <laughs> and coming back from the flashback, we see Eno like grabbing his hat. And this is like the second time that Eno has been associated with Nanami. And it makes me wonder if he has something to do with Nanami's coming back, but it just seems like something along the lines of him coming back without physically coming back is going to happen. Like, I don't know, his curse technique comes back or something he left behind comes back. Not really sure, but Nanami is definitely gonna do something. <laughs> but we come back to Gojo taking on Sukuna and he's just ripping him through the environment. And he eventually goes for this blue attack where he sucks in all this debris, but Sukuna breaks out of it and tries to counter him, but almost gets his head stepped on. And he's able to flip out of it, but then we see that Gojo is somehow able to create like clones, but Sukuna instantly picks the correct one. And they wind up gauging distance. And we see that Gojo has pretty much figured out what he needed to figure out at this point. Because if you'll notice throughout this battle, Maharaga's wheel, the Dharma Chakra, has been changing colors. And Sukuna says the meaning of the ritual for summoning Maharaga and his wheel is complete circulation and balance. Maharaga adapts to the attack after taking in and having the wheel spin, which we all knew at this point. And the wheel does spin. And it's like, what did he adapt to at that point? But then we get Gojo's inner monologue, and he basically says that when Sukuna uses domain amplification, you know, in order to be able to hit Gojo in the first place, the Dharma Chakra wheel turns black. And you can actually see when it was happening during their fight. So when that happens, it no longer has the ability to adapt. And that makes sense because domain amplification shuts down your curse technique when you use it. You basically gain this little filter to be able to get past other people's curse techniques in exchange for using your own. And Gojo also figures out that this means that domain amplification isn't a barrier technique. Since both Gojo and Sukuna, but more so Sukuna in this case, burnt out the part of their brain that uses barrier techniques, which is why they're unable to use domain expansions right now. So he's like, oh, I guess it wasn't a barrier technique. Then after another quick exchange, 
We come back to the sorcerers talking about Maharaga and how he isn't coming out. And Hikari asks, like, for the limitless attack, does it have to be spun several times? And this is something that we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. It's like, Maharaga can adapt to anything, but how far does it go? Like, and how broad is it? Because Gojo can manipulate limitless in multiple ways. So if he just hits him with the base of limitless, you know, just space manipulation or whatever, then does he become adapted to the entire technique and all the variances of it and i guess he doesn't because going further gojo's like you need four spins total to be able to overcome limitless so you need three more so he adapted to limitless void instant attack inside of his domain expansion and he also needs to adapt to limitless itself blue red and purple so i guess this means that he's adapted to limitless at its base or was it blue that he was adapting to i guess it was that I'm not really sure. I can't tell for myself from this panel, but considering that he has three left, he has to adapt it to one of them that isn't Limitless Void. Or I assume that's how it's going here. But it's also interesting that Gojo himself is saying this. Now it could be like a binding vow or showing your hand. Like explaining this could make something stronger for Gojo, but it also could be disinformation. Maybe it's not exactly four, but it's five. And the fifth could be what his maximum technique is, something we've also been talking about for a while that he hasn't exactly shown yet. At this point, I don't think we know if Limitless has a maximum technique, right? So I guess that's like the last thing here. Like he tricks Sukuna into thinking that he's fully adapted to Limitless with Maharaga. Like Maharaga comes out after three more adapts, then Gojo's like, yeah, I lied. <laughs> and then does his maximum technique possibly. Or there could be something else that happens because coming into the end of the chapter, Gojo's like, you know, I'll kill you before the three spins. And then we see Angel watching. She's like, did he forget about Megumi? And of course he didn't forget about Megumi. I do think that Gojo probably learned how to use reverse curse techniques on others. And he's going to use that on Megumi to save him, regardless of the outcome here, or at least his body. Like I don't think he plans on killing Megumi just to take out Sukuna. And the very last panel we see Kashimo saying, it's okay to forget about him. Because Kashimo of course wants to kill Sukuna. And I'm sure he thinks that Gojo probably can't get the job done here because he's also mentioned before that he'll jump in if Gojo dies or if something happens like that and this is like the second time Kashimo is like being shown here being hungry to go after Sukuna that's like his whole purpose in the series and we also know that he has a curse technique that you can only perform once and it's probably some ultra powerful lightning thing that could in theory take down somebody as powerful as Sukuna if they're just hit with it you know point blank or whatever so that's going to happen I just don't know if it's going to happen before or after Gojo is defeated or man, I don't know, but it's a really exciting prospect. So coming into this chapter, we see Sukuna's Dharma Chakra wheel spinning because apparently something had happened off panel in between the previous chapter and this one. And Yuji says, there's the second spin. And Kusakabe says two more spins and it'll adapt to Gojo's infinity. That's because in the previous chapter, Gojo straight up told Sukuna that Maharaga's Dharma Chakra wheel only needs to spin four times times to completely adapt to Gojo's infinity or limitless and considering that it had already spun two or three chapters ago it now only requires three more spins to completely adapt to Gojo making Maharaga like invincible against him essentially and like I said something just happened off panel at the beginning of this chapter which caused the wheel to spin again so now there's only two spins left and we're gonna see the third one pretty soon because Gojo starts throwing like these blue balls <laughs> or blue spheres I guess you could say at Sakuna blue being the lapse of his curse technique as they call it in this series like Gojo amplifying limitless with regular negative cursed energy which creates like that vacuum ability called blue well he's somehow able to condense this into a projectile sphere and like throws it at Sakuna and eventually catches him off guard and one of these things like slices up the side of his stomach but that's actually a good thing because this causes the wheel to spin yet again for the third time meaning that Maharaga has now adapted to blue 
or at least I assume that's what this means. And Yuji asks, is it time or experience that's needed for the adaptation? And that's a great question because we don't really know. Because we see two possibilities posited here. Either Maharaga gets hit or Sukuna, being the conduit for him using his wheel, gets attacked and then some time passes and then it figures out how to adapt to it or it then understands how the ability or the attack or whatever works. Or alternatively, Maharaga takes multiple attacks and it eventually figures out how to adapt. And before this, I thought it kind of just was like a time thing, maybe even like a fast time thing, because it seems like he adapts relatively fast, right? I didn't think it involved him taking multiple attacks, because it didn't seem that way before, but from what Kashimo says to this statement, by it could be either and that's all there is to it, I think that's Gege also probably telling the audience, that like, hey, it could be either, maybe you'll never know, or maybe I just needed to be a secret for the time being, but I just always assumed it was Maharaga takes attack, adapts to it, if he survives, of course, because that's like the loophole of defeating Maharaga, you have to beat him in one attack. <laughs> Because if you don't, then he'll just adapt to it. So this whole business about him having to spin the wheel four times to adapt to Gojo, I thought that he would be adapting to each of his attacks and like abilities individually. Like neutral limitless, you know, just Gojo's spatial manipulation thing. And then blue, red, and purple. But I guess that's not the case. Because Kusakabe says, you know, Gojo hasn't been using anything aside from blue or laps. And that's because he didn't want Maharaga to adapt to anything else. But I guess that's still just not the case. And he just adapts regardless of what you do, as long as it just happens enough. Which goes back to Kashimo saying that either option is possible and that's all there is to it. So it's just like, yeah, I guess. But speaking of Gojo only using blue, it's because he's been trying to lull Sukuna into this false sense of security, make him think that he won't use anything else, you know, so Maharaga won't adapt. And he eventually gets Sukuna into the perfect situation, countering him, coming behind this pillar, and fires off a curse technique reversal red point blank in his face. Now red, of course, just like blue is the amplified version of Limitless, except with blue, Gojo was using regular negative cursed energy, but with red, he's using positive cursed energy, like the same type used for reverse curse technique, the healing ability. And then it creates like this blast, like this propelling force, you know, the opposite of the vacuum that blue creates. And he shoots Sukuna with this. And Sukuna is able to activate his domain amplification at the last second, you know, coating himself in his own domain to basically neutralize an opponent's curse technique. But at the exchange of shutting down the Dharma Chakra wheel, because we see it like turn dark. And that's because when you use domain amplification, you lose the ability to use your curse technique while you're doing it. We also see Sukuna take some big damage from this. I mean, not too bad. He can just heal from it. But domain amplification, while it does neutralize like base curse techniques, even limitless, as he says, like the neutral version of it, you know, the space manipulation stuff, it can't fully neutralize blue or red. Like he's still going to take some damage from it, especially if he's just standing there. But this is, uh, I guess, what Sakuna ultimately wants. But in theory, he should be able to adapt to it if he gets hit by it again, not using domain amplification, I guess. But Gojo tells him that the red hasn't exploded. So I guess he let it like pass through Sukuna without it exploding and then had it continue to travel around the building, make like a 360 and then come all the way back to the start and hit Sukuna in the back. And he just levels Sukuna with this, but that's not all because he's coming up with a combo and Gojo hits Sukuna with a black flash. Yeah, that's right. A red explosion in the back and then a black flash right in the front. And he straight up knocks Sukuna out with this black flash. Like, that's crazy. So we haven't seen the black flash in a while, actually. Like, it was more prevalent in the first part of the series. But the black flash is a distortion in space that occurs when cursed energy is applied with, like, one millionth of a second or whatever of a physical hit. So, like, right before you make physical contact with somebody and you apply cursed energy, if you do that in, like, the right one millionth of a second you'll create this black flash spatial distortion phenomenon and it says that it like increases the power like two and a half but i don't think that's accurate i think it increases power like times 10 <laughs> because every time we see somebody get hit with a black flash they are getting wrecked by that thing and sakuna you know we just talked about no different here getting freaking knocked out by this but after that happens we see like the 10 shadows darkness stuff open up in the ground and gojo starts to fall into it and the dharma chakra wheel falls as well and maharaga starts coming out and right before that happened 
I think we saw the Dharma Chakra spin. They don't mention it, but after Sukuna gets hit with the Black Flash, I think we see the Dharma Chakra click. And that could mean that either Maharaga has adapted to red because, you know, Sukuna got hit in the back with it, or he adapted to Black Flash. <laughs> I'm not really sure if you can adapt to that. I mean, I guess you can, right? But I assume it could be the red that he got hit with or just neutral limitless if he wasn't already adapted to that, which I assume he had to be. But either way, I guess this is the official fourth spin regardless. And Maharaga on paper at this moment is, is fully adapted to Gojo. And at the end of the chapter, he like slashes him across the chest. Now, I'm not really worried about this. Pretty sure Gojo's just gonna instantly heal from that. I assume that he can. The positive cursed energy blade that Maharaga has shouldn't interfere with that. But as for what Sakuna can do against Maharaga here, I'm not really sure. Now, I guess he can keep hitting him with Black Flash if he didn't adapt to that and he did adapt to Red. Because it's said that you can't like purposely do the Black Flash. It kind of just happens. Like you just get lucky essentially. Or you can just get really nice and go into the flow state, I guess, and then hit it consecutively. Like Nanami has the record for hitting it four times. We actually saw that in the Jujutsu Kaisen Zero movie. But considering that Gojo is a freak, You'd think that he'd be able to surpass that record if he really tried, right? So maybe he hits Maharaga with like five or six or seven black flashes. I mean, if that doesn't happen, I do think that's going to happen with Yuji later on. Like Yuji will do like, I don't know, 10 black flashes or something in a row. But as for Gojo going against Maharaga here, I think he might start getting beaten down in the next chapter. And we might see some of the other sorcerers have to come in and help him. Now, as for Sukuna, he might be straight up KO'd by this. Like, I think he might be out of commission and like Maharaga is going to have to fight the battle here for him. I think that would be a good way to level out the stakes here because if it was Sakuna and Maharaga teaming up on Gojo, then obviously it's pretty much game at that point. But if it's just Gojo versus Maharaga, then that should make things more interesting. So coming off of the previous chapter, we saw Gojo hitting Sukuna with a black flash, possibly knocking him out. But that seemed to cause Maharaga to be summoned. And at this point, Maharaga in theory is completely adapted to Limitless, Gojo's curse technique. And he just slashes Gojo across the chest. And that brings us into the beginning of this chapter where we see Jujutsu Hai continuing to watch the match and Shoko notices that Gojo's healing speed is getting slow but he can still use reverse curse technique which is like the healing ability since he's able to use red you know that blasting move because positive curse energy is required for both of those techniques meaning that gojo can still create positive cursed energy but it's just getting slower and that's understandable he's been fighting sukuna for a very long time and let us not forget that before all this maharaga stuff gojo and sukuna used like five domain expansions back to back and we also found out about the damage that is being done to their brains as well not to mention that a bunch of these chapters have had cliffhangers where gojo is like bleeding from the mouth or something indicating that he is reaching his limit and yeah he's certainly getting to that point more than ever now because not only is his healing slowing down but we're going to see later on that his overall power output is slowing down as well but gojo just goes straight at maharaga and punches him in the face <laughs> It's just funny to me for some reason seeing Maharaga just getting punched in the face. And then he like combos with this like double palm strike, it looks like. Like a Hadouken type motion to Maharaga's solar plexus. That gets a big reaction out of him. And now that Gojo has established the distance with Maharaga, he tries to hit him with a curse technique reversal red. You know, hoping to take him out with just one big blast before he can adapt to it. That's essentially how you have to take down Maharaga. And we're also going to find out that despite Gojo hitting Sukuna with red in the previous chapter, like when he tricked him and hit him in the back with it, Maharaga has still not adapted to red. So it's still an option to just completely take him out. And that's one of Gojo's few options left at this point. But before he's able to fire this off against Maharaga, Sukuna saves him with a rabbit escape. Another Shikigami summon of the Ten Shadows. We've seen Megumi use this before, of course. And as Gojo sees this, he aims down at the shadows in the ground that summon them. And that's also, I guess, saving Maharaga. And Gojo says, seems like Black Flash is effective. 
And that's interesting because that's the only time in this chapter that Black Flash is mentioned, despite it being like the big moment in the previous chapter. And yes, it is very effective. Just one Black Flash from Gojo kind of knocked Sukuna out. I mean, it's debatable if he was completely KO'd or if he was kind of just chilling or if he just used that as an opportunity to summon Maharaga against Gojo, like a counter almost. I mean, he definitely got hurt by it. But considering that he's saving Maharaga here or attempting to save him with the rabbit escape, Sukuna came back to consciousness anyway. And also in my previous review, I said that Black Flash had like a 2.5 times multiplier to the damage done. And I was actually incorrect about that. Sorry guys, it's actually to the power of 2.5. So yeah, way bigger output of damage here, which is uh, completely understandable considering how devastating it was. And like I said, this is the only time it's being mentioned here, but I think Gege put that in there because the Black Flash is going to come back for sure. And that's because Gojo is for sure going to use the Black Flash again, or at least I think he is. I mean, he kind of has to. And I do think Black Flash is also going to be very prevalent in the rest of the series, especially from Yuji. But after Gojo fires this red off, you know, taking out these rabbits, essentially, we see Maharaga like running and Sukuna coming and teaming up with him. And we essentially find out Sukuna's strategy here. He summoned Maharaga as like this utility to shut down Limitless for Gojo, because now that he has adapted to it, you know, because we found out in the previous chapter, Maharaga only needed to have his Dharma Chakra wheel spin four times to completely adapt to Limitless. And now that that's happened, it's taken the form of Maharaga's sword or Maharaga himself. I don't know, because we see Maharaga's sword coming down on Gojo and Gojo's like blocking it. And it's at that point, Limitless is being shut off. So I guess that's how Maharaga has adapted to Limitless. He's become like his own proprietary reverse horn of heaven in a way. You know, the cursed tool that Toji used against Gojo to shut down Limitless. And this is just unbelievable. Like, I know I've said this before, but Maharaga is just a little too powerful. I mean, he's not broken. Like, he can be beaten, obviously, and he can be beaten down physically. But the fact that he can just adapt this way and shut down the greatest curse technique ever on paper, I mean, at least just overall. I mean, the way that Sukuna uses the Ten Shadows makes it seem like that's the best curse technique, but just Limitless overall, you don't have to really think about it. You could be like a pay to win kid about it. But with Limitless, you don't really have to do too much thinking. Like you could just be a pay to win kid about it, you know? But with the 10 Shadows, you definitely have to think and be strategic and have some skill and knowledge to be able to fully utilize it. Limitless, not so much. You're kind of just God. But anyway, I'm rambling. Sukuna fires off what looks to be a piercing blood at Gojo, but it's not. Sukuna is actually using the water blast ability that the Max Elephant Shikigami from the Ten Shadows uses, but he's using it through his hands and he's firing it off like a piercing blood would be fired off. Now, Sukuna learned this obviously from seeing Piercing Blood done through Choso and Noritoshikamo, but I'm sure Sukuna saw the Piercing Blood a thousand years ago, or at least I assume it was around back then. Could be wrong about that. But it's an awesome strategy because like we were talking about, Maharaga now has the ability to shut down Limitless, I guess when he makes contact with Gojo, because as he's making contact with Gojo, that's when Sukuna's piercing water, I guess you could call it, hits Gojo on the arm, but he's able to deflect it. So once again, Sukuna with the big brain strategy here, fully utilizing the 10 shadows and just really looking like the superior sorcerer here. And I'm not saying that Gojo is like a lesser to a great extent, because he's not. Gojo is incredible. On top of just having his inherent talent and everything handed to him in life, he definitely utilizes it as a hard worker would as well. Like he is almost as skillful as Sukuna, but just not as much. Like if Sukuna is a 10, I would say Gojo is like a nine, but that's not even everything that's going on here. I would have been satisfied if it was just Sukuna and Maharaga taking on Gojo, because that's more than enough for Gojo to handle here, of course. And that's something that we've been looking forward to for a while. So Especially when it was teased a couple chapters ago, when we saw Maharaga come out for the first time, but then Sukuna put him back into the shadows because he wanted him to be fully adapted to Limitless before he had him go full force on Gojo. But now that he's adapted, now we're seeing that double team. But Sukuna takes it one step further and he summons another Shikigami from the Ten Shadows, but it's one we've never seen before. And that's because it's implied, I guess, that he is fusing together new the Owl 
whole Shikigami and totality. You know, I'm assuming he's talking about the wolf Shikigami and he's making Chimera Beast Agito. Now, I don't know if he's literally doing that here. I'm just guessing because he says new totality. And then considering that Agito is named Chimera Beast, you know, Chimera is like a fusion of animals, or at least I, I think that's what it means, something like that. That's possibly what he could have did here. And this Agito Shikigami is similar to Maharaga. As to where it has like a humanoid form, as to where the other Shikigamis obviously don't look like this, like they resemble animals or whatever. Maharaga resembles some kind of like demon alien, and Agito is the same way, except uh, I, I guess a female. So now Sukuna has this new crazy amalgamation of a Shikigami with Agito and he has Maharaga. So it's 3v1 against Gojo, as he says. And this also makes me wonder, like, how far can this go? If in theory he can fuse together two Shikigamis to make a beast like this, can he just fuse them all together? Can he just fuse all 10 of the Shikigamis together and then make God? That would be too much. But it is possible. But why didn't he do it yet? Like fuse Maharaga and Agito together. Is that possible? That would be too broken. Maybe we'll see that happen. I don't know. But we see Agito and Maharaga going after Gojo. And I don't know what Agito can do. I don't like I don't think their abilities are being revealed here. Like we can kind of see it doing something in this one panel where they're both going after Gojo, but I just I don't know what it's doing here. Is it like forming something with its hands? I don't know, let me know in the comments if you can see what Agito is doing. I'm sure we're gonna see in the next chapter, but Gojo impressively still avoiding these two monster Shikigamis coming at him, but as he's backpedaling, his own shadow that he's projecting on the ground has Sukuna coming out of it. You know, because the 10 shadows, he could just manipulate them. And as Sukuna's coming out of it, he's going to fire off a piercing water <laughs> at Gojo. What an amazing sequence here. Like, when this comes out in the anime in like four years, man, this is going to be the peak of peak. Maybe five years. Don't hold your breath. But that's still not enough. Gojo's able to avoid that and avoid the follow-up strike from Maharaga and get himself into a position as to where he can avoid Agito's strike and have Agito hit Maharaga. Like, I'm pretty sure that's what's happening here. And as that's happening, Gojo finds himself behind Maharaga and hits him with a red right in the back. And I guess normally this would have been enough to take him out, but not in this case. Maharaga takes it. I mean, it hurts him a little, but he survives. And that's because Gojo's output is weakening. That's all there is to it. He's just gassing. He's approaching his limit for sure. So it's understandable that he can't just do this like one massive red and just take out somebody on the level of Maharaga at this point, being so depleted and exhausted. But Gojo also ponders that Maharaga's adaptation must be gradual. And we still don't have like a full answer on how it completely works, but considering that it keeps being mentioned and talked about, maybe it will be revealed. But the long and the short of it is that Maharaga will take longer to adapt to red than blue, and just base limitless. I guess because it has positive cursed energy involved in it, because red is like when you apply positive cursed energy to limitless. And then coming into the end of the chapter, after Gojo realizes that he can't take out Maharaga with a red, he realizes that he only has one shot left. One final move that he can do to completely take out Maharaga in one shot, so he doesn't have to worry about him anymore. And he says that I have to use it, the unlimited hollow technique. And that's the end of the chapter. So I'm sure our minds immediately go to purple because that's the title that precedes purple, hollow technique purple. You know, when blue and red come together, they create purple the imaginary mass blast, I guess you can call it. You know, I'm sure you've seen season one when Gojo fires it off. He's just firing like this no clip IRL eraser tool at reality. <laughs> I guess that's the way you can describe it. And I don't know if that's what he's going to do here. I mean, he fired off a purple at Sukuna in the very beginning of the fight, but he obviously hasn't used it since then. So I'm not entirely sure if he is talking about purple here because why wouldn't he just say purple? You know, they're keeping it ambiguous. He's like, I have to use 
it. And then he says the unlimited hollow technique. So maybe it's not purple because also the way that hollow technique purple is presented, it makes it seem like there are multiple hollow techniques, not just purple because it's like hollow technique colon purple. So this could finally be coming to what we've been talking about for months now. And it's Gojo's maximum technique or the maximum technique of limitless, which I'm pretty sure we haven't seen yet. And this might be it. And whatever it is, apparently has a charge time where Sukuna will be aware of it. So Gojo really has to do something crazy here to avoid three ultra powerful characters all bloodlustedly attacking him to charge up an attack that could in theory wipe out at least two of them. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. Cannot wait to see the next chapter. Uh, let me know what you think about all this in the comments, guys. And if you liked the video, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next one. So coming off the previous chapter, we saw Sukuna summon a new Shikigami by the name of Agito, which is actually a fusion of three Shikigami from the Ten Shadows, as we'll come to find out in this chapter. And that, along with Maharaga, gives Sukuna now a 3v1 matchup against Gojo. And coming into this chapter, we see the spectators reacting, and Akotsu says that he's gonna go out there, like, to help Gojo now. And Kashimo's like, don't interfere, at least you're not next. Meaning that, like, you know, Kashimo has next because he called next first. <laughs> Like when this fight started, he said that if Gojo were to lose, then he would step in next to take on Sukuna because fighting Sukuna is Kashimo's like entire main motivation in this series. Like he was promised this fight by Kenjaku 400 years ago. So he's not just going to let Akotsu jump in line. Then Hikari says that Gojo only allowed for them to enter if he himself got weaker than them. So that's interesting, I guess. During the time skip between Gojo being unsealed and to him fighting Sukuna, at some point they did put in some contingencies that we just weren't aware of until now. So Gojo just wasn't going to like blindly sacrifice himself and just fight to the death meaninglessly. And I guess even currently as fatigued and worn out as Gojo is, he's still not as weak, quote unquote, as Akotsu and Agari are. Then Akotsu says that since Sukuna's domain expansion is disabled, you know, since they had that whole back and forth using it like five times, he can get in there and use Rika to fight against the two Shikigamis for Gojo while Gojo just continues to fight Sukuna by himself. And that's a really interesting proposition there because like what would happen if that went down? Like I'm sure Rika would destroy Agito, but could Akotsu defeat Maharaga? And it's like, I don't know. I mean, maybe Akotsu and Rika going against Maharaga would have an easier time, but this whole beginning of the chapter really gets my mind going with all the potential matchups here and how much fun it could be, just with speculation alone. You know, like Kashimo versus Akotsu or Hakari versus Akotsu or any of them versus Maki. And speaking of her, she comes in and she says, you know, if anyone's going, it's me. Don't forget your role, talking to Kashimo. Like, if you're defeated, some of our insurance will be gone. And she's referring to Kashimo's curse technique, which apparently he can only use once. And it's like so powerful that it can probably take out Sukuna, which Kashimo is essentially holding it for. And Maki saying that she wants to come in here goes back to what I was saying. It's like, what about Maki versus Maharaga? Could she just cut his soul with the quickness and take him out? Or would he adapt to that? Would he adapt to his soul being cut? I guess, right? If he can adapt to any and all phenomena. But anyway, Yuji steps in and he's like, Akotsu, you know, go for it. We need this. And I love that Yuji says this because it makes sense. It's like, yeah, this is the point where we should all jump in and, you know, gang up on Sukuna and just take him down. Like the villains are outnumbered at this point. And I just appreciate that Yuji is acknowledging that and just taking the pragmatic approach here because, you know, in other series, they would be like, no, we have to let them fight each other by themselves. When a lot of the issues in like multiple series, you know, in Battle Shonen or just Battle Manga in general, could have been solved if they all just ganged up on the villain. <laughs> but of course, it would just be too easy if we did that. And Kusakabe steps in and he's like, you, know, you guys don't understand anything. Because then Kusakabe puts out other options of maybe they're able to handle Kenjaku, and I think all of them teaming up could easily take down Kenjaku. Don't get me wrong, he's pretty powerful, but not strong enough to fight against all of the spectators here. Kusakabe also says that Sukuna must have some kind of trump card that he's preserving, and if they go out, he might use it, so... I do appreciate the way that Gege is handling this here. He is giving like a legitimate excuse as to why they shouldn't all gang up on Sukuna. Kusakabe's like, you know, 
what if Sukuna has this trump card? And it is very possible, but at least an explanation is being given here. And this also could be foreshadowing, like maybe he really does have a trump card. I mean, I guess he does, right? There's obviously things that he hasn't shown against Gojo that we know that he has, namely the fire arrow. And also he has, uh, you know, what some kind of scheme to get his original body back too, which we're for sure going to see at some point. Along with the full reveal of whatever his curse technique is and all of the abilities within in it or whatever he can do whether it's a curse technique or some kind of proprietary jujitsu ability that he developed but they ultimately decide on hey it's just better if we just let gojo go about it and just take him down and then we could just deal with everything after that and they punctuate it with it would be lame to interfere with it and at this point i kind of agree with that at least just for entertainment's sake but for the sake of pragmatism for sure it could have been handled a little better, but it's fine. But we come back to Gojo taking on the two Shikigami and he's having somewhat of an easy time with them. I think he lands the Black Flash on Agito, but maybe he doesn't because if he did, he surely would have killed it maybe, but I don't know. Maybe it's just showing that he's fatigued and regressed so much that not even a Black Flash is really doing that much. Not really sure. Maybe it's just a similar art style. But anyway, Gojo winds up ripping off Agito's snake tail. And he says that Agito is what happens when Nu then inherited the Great Serpent, which Sakuna also fought in the past, back in his first encounter with Megumi, Morn Tiger, and Round Deer. So I don't think we knew this in the previous chapter, right? Because Sukuna said new and totality, right? Unless that was a mistranslation or I'm reading it wrong. But now it turns out that it's new with the great serpent and Morn Tiger. We've never heard of that before, as far as I know. And I think that completes the 10 shadows. Like that's the final one that we didn't know about. And he also says that because of Round Deer, it has the ability to heal itself because that was like Round Deer's thing. It had positive curse energy and could imbue reverse curse technique on the user, which was like a great utility. I really enjoyed that aspect of Sukuna's fight against Yorozu. But it gives Gito the ability to regenerate, of course, too. And while it's not adapted to Limitless like Maharaga, it still essentially needs to be taken out in one big blast, similar to Maharaga. So that's what Gojo aims to do here after easily evading the strikes of both Maharaga and Nagito here, somewhat playing with them, really showing that Gojo isn't entirely reliant on Limitless. Like he's just a great sorcerer or just a physical specimen in general. Like he could just get around with cursed energy reinforcement. I mean, the six eyes also helps with that too. It's not like Maharaga is adapting to the six eyes. Although that would be crazy if he could somehow figure out how to do that. But we get an inner monologue from Sukuna while Gojo is doing this. And he essentially says that he was able to survive the initial purple that Gojo shot at the beginning of the fight. But now that he's regressed so much and become so weakened, you know, throughout this fight, that if he were to take another purple at 100%, it would take him out for sure. So he essentially has to really avoid that. Like he can't let Gojo use purple because he knows that that's all that Gojo has left. And we also found that in the previous chapter that Gojo pretty much intends to use purple again because it's his last shot at taking down Maharaga and Sukuna in possibly like a two birds, one stone scenario. At least if he takes down Maharaga, he has a much better chance of taking down Sukuna at that point. Then Sukuna like starts cheering on slash berating Maharaga here. And he's like, you know, how long are you gonna have me waiting? It's like, you're my shadow, not Mugumi's. It's like, show me what you got. And then we see like Maharaga's like, I don't know, it evokes some kind of emotion in Maharaga and his Dharma Chakra wheel spins, indicating that it adapted or learned possibly because he takes off Gojo's arm instantly, but then we also see that he cut cleanly through the buildings behind them. And then Kusakabe says Maharaka can use his slashes, I guess implying Sukuna, right? Meaning that did Maharaga learn cleave from Sukuna? And I guess that seems to be the implication here, right? Which is really cool. It's like not only can Maharaga adapt to his opponent, and learn how to adapt to it, I, I suppose you could say, but now it can also learn from its master, which I, I guess makes sense, right? It can go both ways, but that's just the ultimate mastery of the 10 shadows, like having Maharaga learn your abilities. Now, I don't know if that's fully what's going on here, but come on, considering what Kusakabe is saying and the way that it's depicted, taking off Gojo's arm and going through the building, 
I guess that's what it means. But since Gojo has been so fatigued throughout this battle, the same way that Sukuna has, you know, his healing has slowed down as indicated by Shoko. So losing an arm is really bad at this point. And he starts to get beaten down by Sukuna and the Shigigamis. But then he suddenly just snaps and he throws a maximum output blue at Agito. And it like shoots out of the building and goes into the sky and it just destroys him completely. Like an instant counter turnaround knockout strike from Gojo here. Pretty awesome sequence. This is essentially what he was waiting for. And he was willing to take a shot from Agito straight on his head just to give Agito the killing blow. And in the final panel, we see that Gojo's arm is healing. So I suppose in the next chapter, he will go in completely healed at this point, you know, with his arm back. But then the narrator says 41 seconds later, again, Gojo Satoru's hollow technique purple will leave a scar in Shinjuku. So in the spoilers, I was a little thrown off by this. I thought we were seeing it here, but no, what we're actually seeing going off of the skyscraper is just the maximum output blue, I'm pretty sure, destroying Agito. We haven't seen the purple yet, but the purple is going to be so big, I guess, that it's going to leave, like it's, it says, a scar in Shinjuku, like just tearing up blocks and blocks, maybe miles. And I guess this confirms that Gojo is definitely going to hit Sukuna with a hollow purple or Maharaga at least or he's just going to for sure fire it off meaning that Sukuna fails in preventing him from doing it and how significant is this going to be I, I guess it's going to be the most significant thing that Gojo does because it says the battle enters its climax meaning that the next chapter is the final chapter of Gojo versus Sukuna and we're going to get a winner in that chapter and it kind of has to be Sukuna at this point now I hope that Gojo doesn't die I don't want that it would be cool if Gojo just loses but then still you know is alive I don't know if he's nerfed or he loses his curse technique or something. I don't know. But if he stays alive, that's obviously what we want. But we also have to accept that there's a very real chance he could die. Maybe not in the next chapter, but in the next couple chapters, it's very possible. But he's going to go out with a bang regardless. Or there's just like a massive twist and somehow Gojo wins and then, I don't know, Sukuna runs away? <laughs> no, I think we're too late in the game for that. I do think that they're going to have a stretch of chapters where they go to like their own corners, you know what I mean? Like we need to have a break, I guess. Unless Genki just plans to go straight into everyone fighting Sukuna and then that fight just rides out the rest of the series. But there's still a lot of unfinished business with a few other things. And Kajaku still needs to make that giant Kenjaku Japanese population curse thing, right? That still is going to happen. So yeah, we still got a lot of things to go over. But So coming over the previous chapter, we saw Maharaga take off Gojo's arm, but Gojo was eventually able to launch a projectile blue that completely destroyed Agito, but also went off to another location in the city. We're actually going to come back to where that went. And that brings us to this chapter where we see Gojo completely heal his arm with reverse curse technique as we assume that he would. And the narration says that Sukuna is feeling nervous for the first time in a thousand years and that's pretty crazy. I mean it's not like it was a steady thousand years, but considering that Sukuna was like the top dog in the Hian era, when it's implied that the power scale was at its greatest, Sukuna is now feeling nervous for the first time since then. Now that he's running out of cards to use against Gojo. And after a brief physical exchange, Gojo just throws Sukuna into Maharaga and lands a third black flash. But Maharaga is able to protect Sukuna from it by blocking it with his arms. And I say third because the narrator also says two black flashes in the beginning of the chapter, meaning that in the previous chapter, that was in fact a black flash that Gojo lands on Agito. I thought it was peculiar that Gege didn't make note of it, he didn't like say that it was a black flash or anything. We kind of just saw the aesthetic of it and had to decide for ourselves. It was like Gege showing and not telling, which is interesting. But the black flash also wasn't as impactful as it was against Sukuna in previous chapters. Just as it isn't as impactful landing on Maharaga in this sequence. It does blast them through a building, but it's not like a game ending impact like it was before. Then Gojo starts chanting and we go into a narration about the start of a big move. This is in reference to Gojo using purple. Like this is the start of the big sequence that's going to lead to that. Gojo can't just use purple like he traditionally has before this against Sukuna. 
as we've seen Gojo just start chanting or he'll just go into anime descriptive of his final move mode and we'll see him summon the blue and red orbs and then fuse them together into the purple and then launch it like a projectile similar to what he does with blue. But he can't do that against Sukuna because if he just sits there and tries to summon the move like that, Sukuna will obviously kill him or Maharaga will first. So he needs to do it incrementally. And we saw him first launch off that blue, which is still suspended somewhere. We're going to see it very soon. But that means that he's also going to have to systematically include red as well. And Sukuna is very aware of that. And he's kind of waiting for him to do it because he thinks that he can just have Maharaga go after it and just take it head on and then fully adapt to it because he hasn't adapted to red yet he's only adapted to blue then gojo actually does it he fires off curse technique reversal red but into the sky not towards sukuna or maharaga then sukuna kind of panics and he calls for maharaga to go after it you know so he can just take it head on and then adapt to it but also prevent gojo from fusing it with the blue to make purple but as maharaga is trying to track it down in the sky he comes across the blue orb that was just chilling up there after it had destroyed agito like i said before this is gojo's incremental construction of purple but since maharaga is completely adapted to blue he could just destroy this orb. So before he even has a chance to do that, Gojo comes between Maharaga and the blue orb, using blue itself to like propel himself, and then just levels Maharaga in the face. And now that he's unable to go after the red and the blue orb, Sukuna has to do it himself. So he fires off his foe piercing blood, which is not actually blood, it's the water from the Max Elephant Shikigami from the Ten Shadows that he's firing using the foundation of piercing blood. And he fires it off in an attempt to stifle the blue or the red. But Gojo just levels Sukuna as well. But Sukuna thinks that it doesn't matter because it was already fired. And Gojo starts chanting again. And it was just in the nick of time that he chanted enough to reinforce blue so that it was strong enough to just take the piercing water. Then Gojo finishes his chance and it's pretty much game at that point. And you see like the defeat in Sukuna's eyes like, oh no. And then Gojo's face is like the opposite. It's a pretty cool sequence. And then he says purple as he fuses together red and blue. And like I said before, he traditionally fires it off like he would like blue, like a projectile orb or something. And it's like an orb of imaginary mass that kind of just eraser tools through reality but when he performs it here it goes off like a nuke it's like a nuke of imaginary mass <laughs> and i know that he doesn't say that it's maximum technique but i guess this is the closest we're going to get to it since i suppose this is gojo's final move here because you know we've been talking about that for a while now and i was really hoping that we'd get to see what the maximum technique of limitless was and i guess at this point we're not going to get that and this is uh, like i said the closest and it's pretty cool pretty satisfying i suppose just a massive explosion that just erases reality in its vicinity but of course the drawback is that it's hitting the user itself since gojo's at the epicenter but apparently since it's comprised of his own cursed energy it didn't nuke him or just vaporize him completely so he's like okay but uh who's not okay is maharaga because maharaga is getting vaporized by this thing even his wheel is getting destroyed so this is the plan the whole time, of course, for Gojo to use the purple to destroy Maharaga in one shot so that he can't adapt to it. So now he's gone, and Sukuna also survives this, however. But his left hand is gone, and he's really beaten down and withered. Gojo, on the other hand, he's able to heal from this. And in the final panel, we see him fully, you know, regenerating. And this is where they start to call game on this fight. Because Kusakabe says that Gojo has his reverse curse technique output back from the black flashes, but Sukuna has slow healing and Maharag is gone and he can't get into a physical fight with Gojo because he can't use domain amplification. Now, I don't know if that's 100% truthful or if Kusakabe is being an unreliable narrator or if that is the case, then yeah, Sukuna is pretty screwed here because it says at the end that Gojo wins. I mean, he hasn't literally won yet. I mean, obviously they're both still standing, but it's implying that Gojo is just the winner because he's put Sukuna in a checkmate situation. So it's like, can Sukuna respond to this check? And I think that he can. In the previous chapter, they talked about Sukuna having some kind of trump card in case the others came in to help Gojo. And while he 
for sure probably has one for that. I'm sure he has a trump card for just straight up losing to Gojo cleanly, you know? And we're going to see it happen in the next chapter. Because I think that this is Gege trying to give Gojo his flowers, if you will. Like, give him his dues. Like, this is his way of having Gojo straight up declared the winner of the fight so that the audience will now say that oh gojo was the winner when they fought gojo won cleanly that was it however something nefarious is going to happen in the next chapter that leads to gojo i don't know getting killed or something i mean i don't want him to die of course but it just doesn't seem like gege is just gonna let gojo go this cleanly like we're gonna ride this high of gojo winning and then something's gonna happen and it's gonna be like oh are you serious and it's going to be dirty. So just look out for that. Could be Kenjaku interference or something. Or Urarame. Or it could have something to do with Yorozu. Maybe Yorozu. Whatever happened with Yorozu and Sukuna. Not saying that Yorozu constructed some kind of cursed tool. Because I don't think Yorozu can do that. But she did something. That could come into play here. But yeah, that's uh, pretty much it for this one. I guess if you want, we could say Gojo won. But... I won't call this fight off until the next chapter or until we have a definitive like winner. Until like someone is dead, completely unconscious, knocked out, or the fight kind of just ends by everyone going their separate ways. I need one of those situations to play out, you know? So I'm just gonna have to wait a little bit more before I'm satisfied. And I think Gege did that on purpose. So I'm sure you already know what's going on before coming into this video because this chapter basically already shows us as it starts because we see Gojo in this afterlife uh, ethereal plane uh, with his deceased Jujutsu High friends. And that's because Gojo himself is dead. I know, that's wild and out of the blue, like a huge shocker because... In the previous chapter, it was kind of the opposite, right? He was still alive and he was being declared the winner by the sorcerers who were watching. Because he kind of put Sukuna in like a checkmate situation, right? Where Gojo had defeated Maharaga, severely wounded Sukuna, whose healing had slowed down and was also unable to use his domain expansion. As to where, on the other hand, Gojo was still ready to go. But now... Coming into this chapter, he's dead and <laughs> talking to his friends, which is like, you know, I said wild. And Geto asks Gojo, he's like, you know, so how was Sukuna? And Gojo was like, he was crazy strong and he wasn't giving it all he had. I don't think I would have won even if he didn't have the 10 shadows. And that's like a crazy controversial statement. Like that's gonna anger a lot of people reading that. And I don't know if that's like a grand definitive statement there. This could just be Gojo reaching a state of humility now that he has died. But considering what he also says a little bit later, with Sukuna wasn't able to give me his all though, I think it's pretty much true. Uh, both statements there because Sukuna definitely didn't give him his all we didn't see Sukuna use his fire ability whatever that is the fire arrow thing that he used against Jogo whether that's a curse technique or him manipulating cursed energy the way that Kashimo does and makes his lightning still don't know but he didn't use that against Gojo and then raised the question of like what else wasn't he using aside from him not having all 20 fingers and not having his true body but regardless you know gojo pushed him it was like high diff for sure for sakuna to be able to defeat him and speaking of that after gojo finishes speaking with his friends here in the uh, pseudo afterlife airport we come to gojo on the ground and he's dead and it's because he was like cut in half off panel and it goes back to what i was saying like how did this happen because he was just standing there facing off against sakuna sakuna was severely damaged no maharaga and now he's just dead well we find out how sakuna did it at least but we don't get to see how it played out visually so we hear sakuna saying that maharaga's adaptation can only start after a single attack and then it slowly starts to analyze and its completion is only a matter of time but if it receives another identical attack during that period it accelerates the adaptation and even after it's adapted it continues to adapt further which is insane 
So that confirms what we were wondering and what the series actually posited itself a few chapters back, like how Maharaga's ability works, his adaptation. Is it time-based or is it like volume-based? And it's a little bit of both. More so instantaneously, kind of. But going further, Sukuna says that what he wanted from Maharaga was a model of how to tear through infinity because Maharaga was adapting to infinity by altering the essence of his own cursed energy. And that was something that Sukuna couldn't do. Like, that's how Maharaga was able to, like, strike Gojo and just bypass Limitless in the first place. But Sukuna couldn't do that, so he was waiting for Maharaga to do another thing to adapt to Limitless. And that's when he finally saw him do a slash that could bypass it. So, going back to chapter 234, we saw Gojo fighting against Maharaga and Agito at the same time. And Gojo was doing pretty well. And Sukuna started giving Maharaga like this pep talk. And Maharaga's wheel spun, indicating that it adapted yet again. And then after that, he fired off a slash that cut off Gojo's arm. And Sukuna was like very good. Because it was like at that moment, that's what Sukuna wanted. This is something that Sukuna can learn. Because that was like a slashing attack. It's something similar to what Gojo does with Cleave and Dismantle. And it also goes back to what Sukuna was saying about Maharaga continuing to adapt after it had already adapted. Because previously, it had already adapted to Limitless as to where he could just strike Gojo and whatnot. But then we saw his wheel spin yet again. Then he slashed him because it further adapted, which is like so crazy. So what this adaptation actually was is Maharaga altering the essence of his cursed energy as he initially was doing. But this time with the slash, he's cutting, as Sukuna says, existence itself. So it's bypassing Limitless by just cutting everything there. So it doesn't matter if Gojo was standing there coated in Limitless or had like a adamantium barrier protecting him. It doesn't matter. Everything that exists right there is being cut, which is like the strongest thing, you know, in this series for sure. And I think I said this in my spoilers video, but this reminds me of Kuwabara from Yu Yu Hakusho. Eventually he becomes so powerful that his sword can like cut through dimensions. <laughs> and it's possible that Gege was inspired by that maybe since, you know, he is a big Togashi fan. But I wonder if Maharaga is using the same principle as Limitless itself, since it was said that Limitless targets cursed energy on a molecular scale. That's how it alters space. So I suppose Maharaga could be doing the same thing. Instead of like altering and moving space like Limitless, he's just cutting it. Meaning that, you know, it's cutting Limitless itself since it's not bypassing Maharaga since they're using the same fundamental. And then that's what's happening off panel here with Sukuna killing Gojo and cutting him in half. I guess Gojo kind of walked up to him thinking that Sukuna was defeated and then Sukuna just fires from the hip like a cleave and just cuts him in half with Gojo not being none the wiser. Now, how Sukuna did this could have been done one of two ways, I suppose. So first of all, he just watched how Maharaga did it and he figured it out organically and just did it by manually manipulating cursed energy because he said he needed to see something that he could do and the slashing attacks are in his repertoire and it was also said by angel that if he sees anything once he'll be able to do it such as with you know him seeing gojo healing his own brain which led sukuna doing the same thing so sukuna can now fire off cleave and dismantles that cut through space <laughs> essentially right now it's that or another fun possibility is that maharaga being completely destroyed by gojo's purple led to Maharaga being absorbed by Sukuna because, you know, the Ten Shadows. We know that when their Shikigamis die, they get passed on, like their life force gets passed on to the other Shikigamis and they become totality. So what would happen when Maharaga dies? Does he go to another Shikigami or does he go to the user itself? And then the user gains whatever he adapted. That would be pretty cool, but I guess that's not what's happening here. I guess it's just Sukuna using his uh, jujitsu geniusry to figure out how to do this on the fly by just watching Maharaga, which is so cool. Like he just used Maharaga as like a jujitsu problem solving computer. He was like, all right, I can't quite figure out how to defeat Gojo because of his overpowered curse technique. But if I have this Shikigami computer, 
that can figure it out. I'll just use him to give me the data and I'll use that data to defeat him myself. And uh, that's essentially what he did. You can call him a fraud, that's fine, but come on, you gotta admit that's pretty cool. And I'm not discrediting Gojo in any way. He did amazing. He had a, a lot of amazing moments in this fight. He even taught Sakuna a few things himself. But um, at the end of the day, Gojo kinda had to die. And I'll talk more about this in my video on Sunday, but Gojo doesn't have to be number one. That spot is supposed to be for Sakuna. It was always kind of said that it was, rather than Gojo being the modern strongest. But Gojo did well. You know, his, his time came, and now it's time for, you know, Yuji to take over at this point. But aside from that, there, there's still something else that happens because at the very end of the chapter, Kashimo comes in. And we knew that this was going to happen because Kashimo said a couple of chapters back that if Gojo dies or is defeated, he's going against Sukuna next. And Kashimo's whole entire motivation in the series is to fight Sukuna. He comes from like 400 years ago where Kenjaku found him and made a deal with him. And the whole deal was like, hey, you know, I'll reincarnate you to come back in the culling game to where you could fight Sukuna. Because Kashimo was like, I don't know, an old guy looking for a good fight and he couldn't find anybody strong enough which is exactly the same thing that has afflicted Sukuna it's even touched on in this chapter by Gojo he even references it the same way that Yorozu does the loneliness that comes with unrivaled strength the one who will teach you about love is well that was more so Yorozu saying that but it's referenced in the chapter nonetheless. And that's what's kind of linking Kashimo and Sukuna here because Kenjaku told Kashimo that the strongest sorcerer he ever met was Sukuna. So now he's finally getting the moment to fight Sukuna. And we also found out that Kashimo has a curse technique, but he can only use it once. Like when he was fighting against Hikari, he was just manipulating cursed energy to make it like lightning. And considering that the narration is also saying the god of lightning, Kashimo Hajime here, I think it's confirming that Gege has based Kashimo off of Indra. Indra who is the king of devas or the god of lightning, or I guess you could say like the Hindu god of lightning. And he had this weapon called the Vajra. And it's like a super powerful thunderbolt essentially. And I'm thinking that's what Kashimo's curse technique probably is. It's like just one big massive thunderbolt, lightning bolt, whatever. And it just, it could kill anyone essentially, even Sukuna. Like maybe even more powerful than purple. And I really wonder if he's going to hit Sukuna with it because you know, he can't kill Sukuna here because Megumi needs to survive in my opinion. Like he absolutely needs to live. Yes, the story is sad and a lot of characters die clearly, but I don't think Megumi is going to be one of them. But I do think that Kashimo will have his moment where he wrecks Sukuna, but something happens to where Megumi lives too. And Sukuna ultimately needs to get his true form anyway. So yeah, expect all of that to happen in some way or another in the next couple chapters. But that's pretty much it for this one, guys. Let me know what you think about this chapter in the comments. And if you liked the video, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.